Hi everyone and welcome to this all-in-one CIE coordinated science for the subject of physics. Here you'll find we're going through every single specification point so by the end you should feel really confident ahead of your exams. Don't forget my perfect answer revision guide is available on the website in case you want to learn those answers for yourselves. Let's start by looking at the general physics topic of length and time. So jumping in with how is volume measured? And we use a measuring cylinder for this. So remember, it's a plastic tube with increments on the side. It's not a very precise piece of equipment. And you fill it with the liquid, say up to here, read across, and therefore you have your volume. Looking at length now, you'll use various pieces of apparatus here. You could use a meter ruler if you're looking at quite a long item. Otherwise, use a centimetre ruler, so the rulers will measure millimetres to centimetres to metres, and use what's called a micrometer screw gauge, and this will measure extremely small distances as given by that micrometer. Looking at measuring the interval of time, a clock, stop clock, or stop watch will be useful here. There are two main types. You've got the one which looks like a clock face, and that's an analog measurement of time. And you often find if you're measuring seconds and you're using a stopwatch, it will move around, and then you press the stop button and you can measure the time. A more precise way is using a digital clock, as this can measure to the nearest hundredth of a second. Moving on a little bit, and now we need to look at how we would calculate the average value of a short distance, such as the distance a javelin is thrown. So you want to, crucially, measure the distance multiple times. And we're going to call this n. Then you want to add all the results together. And then finally divide by n to get that average distance. Similarly, if you're calculating the average value of time, you want to measure the time multiple times. We'll call that n again. Add the times together. And again, divide by n. Now looking specifically at a pendulum, so that's a string which has a weight at the end which moves backwards and forwards in an arc. So the time period of the pendulum is the time taken to complete one oscillation. And the best and most accurate way to do this is measure the time taken for n number of swings and then divide by n. Now we're going to take a look at the speed distance time topic. So there are some very key equations that you need to be aware of. So you know me, I love formula triangles. So I'm going to have my first one here, which is d at the top, then s, then t. Now you cover whatever it is that you're after. So I'm after distance. So if I cover that over with my thumb, I can see that it's therefore speed times time. If I'm after speed, then we're going to do distance divided by time. And then lastly, time is distance divided by speed. So if they ask you for the equation, sure, use your formula triangles to actually work out what the equation is, but you must write out the full equation to get the mark. Formula triangles do not count. So as you can see on the left hand side, I've drawn very poorly a distance time graph and I'm after the speed at point A. So to work out the speed I know that I need to do distance divided by time. I can read that straight off the graph so I can see that the distance travelled is 8. The time was 4 seconds so simple calculation. The speed is therefore 2 meters per second 
meters per second due to the units we can see on the y-axis, which was that distance was given in meters and time was given in seconds. It's important to understand these graphs fully because they could ask you, for example, how long was the car stationary for? So in terms of stationary, you're looking at the flat parts of the graph. So the car is stationary here. Why? Because it remains at 8 metres throughout that time. So how long was the car stationary for? Have a look along here. And the answer here is 4 seconds. This is a different type of graph. So the velocity time graph or the speed time graph, not to be confused with the distance time graph. So we are being asked to find out the acceleration at point A on the graph. So acceleration is given by the equation acceleration equals final speed minus initial speed over time. And a neater way to write that is A equals B minus U over T. So looking at portion A of the graph, what is the final speed? Well, it's given here. So read across and you'll see that it is 5. The initial speed is given here, and we know that's 0, so 5 minus 0. The time taken was 4 seconds, so the answer here is 1.25. Now, be careful with your units. You're looking for meters per second squared for acceleration. Another thing they like to ask you is to calculate the distance traveled. Now, this is a longer task, and remember, distance traveled is given by the area under the graph. So let's calculate the entire distance travelled by this particular vehicle. So the way I like to do this is by splitting it up. You can work it out as a trapezium or you can work it out as two triangles and a rectangle, which I personally find easier. So I'm going to label them A, B and C. So area A is given by this formula. Well, it's a triangle, so I need to put in a half immediately. Times it by the height of the triangle, which is 5. Times it by its width. Do the calculation and that will therefore be 10 meters. Area B is more straightforward, it's just a rectangle, so just make sure you're reading the correct length. So it's 5 again, this time times it by 3, you get a value which is 15 meters. Finally, area C, we're back to our triangle, so we need a half, times the height of the triangle, which is 5, times the width of the triangle, which is 2, so we get 5 meters. If you add that up, you get a total area of 30 metres, and that therefore is the distance travelled. Carrying on with this topic, let's ask ourselves what is deceleration? Well, as the name suggests, it is the opposite of acceleration. So we are slowing down, so it's a decreasing changing speed, which is the same as negative acceleration. And remember the units will be meters per second squared, the same as acceleration. Next up, what is free fall? So clearly it needs to be an object which is falling down towards the earth. What is responsible for this? Well, it is gravity. And the acceleration of free fall is measured in G. And notice that this acceleration is constant. I've picked out some questions. So question one, a toy car rolls down a ramp and hits a cushion. The graph shows how its velocity changes with time. So this is effectively a speed time graph. Constant velocity on the graph is shown by, what does the word constant mean? Well, it means same. So where on this graph is it the same velocity? Now you can kind of imagine a y-axis and the numbers going up the y-axis. So it could be something like 0, 10, 20, 30 on the velocity front. So where does that not change? Well, it's obviously going to be the horizontal portion of the line because at that point, the speed or the velocity is going to be the same everywhere. So the answer here is B, the horizontal part of the line. And with these sorts of questions, rather than reading the options through and getting confused, I would look at the question first of all, work out what you think is the answer, and then see if that is an option below. The distance travelled is shown by, well again I told you to work out distance, it's the area under the graph line. Let's look at the options, and that's A. The average velocity of the toy car is given 
by, so remember your equation, velocity or speed equals distance divided by time, therefore that is b. A bus travels along a straight road. The graph shows how the velocity of the bus changes during a short journey. Okay, so we've got a velocity time graph, so again, distance will be given by area under the curve, acceleration will be given by the gradient. Anyway, state the velocity of the bus after 25 seconds, so you're looking up here, the answer here is 6 meters per second. How long is the bus stationary during its journey? Now, I've seen loads of people get this wrong because they think that it's stationary here and here. Well, no, that's absolute rubbish because look at the velocity. It's 12, so stationary means that it was standing still. So standing still means that the velocity must have been zero, which is just this chunk here, and therefore your answer here is 10 seconds. State the equation linking acceleration, change in velocity and time taken. They've given you the exact wording, so you want to write it out as they've written it. So you're going to write acceleration equals change in velocity over time taken, or you could have written A equals V minus U over T. Calculate the acceleration of the bus during the first 10 seconds. Give the unit that's worth three marks. So we'll have a look back up here, and we're looking at this portion of the graph. The first 10 seconds, we're looking at the gradient. So that equation was acceleration equals v minus u over t. So that is final speed, which is 12, minus initial speed, which was 0, over time taken, which was 10. So 12 take 0 over 10 is 1.2. The units of acceleration are meters per second squared. State the equation linking average speed, distance moved, and time taken. Average speed equals distance moved divided by time taken. The bus moves a total distance of 390 metres during the journey. Calculate the average speed of the bus. So, speed equals distance divided by time. Distance is 390 divided by, look on the graph for whatever the time was, and it was 60 seconds. Pop that into your calculator and your answer will be 6.5 metres per second. The bus travels further in the first 30 seconds of its journey than it does during the last 30 seconds of this journey. Explain how the graph shows this. Well, remember that I told you distance is given by area under the graph line, and you can see that the trapezium for the first 30 seconds is way bigger than the one for the second 30 seconds, so therefore clearly the bus travelled further. So for the first mark, state the fact that distance is given by area under the graph, and then for the second mark, compare the, the two areas under the line and you're done. Question 4. The diagram shows some people waiting in a queue at a supermarket. The queue moves forward each time a person leaves the checkout. Person X spends 7 minutes in the queue before reaching the checkout and the graph shows how distance changes with time for person X. So it's the last person in the queue and notice that it is a distance time graph. So what is the initial length of the queue and we're looking for that in metres. So all you have to do is read off here on the y-axis so read along and you'll see, if my pen wasn't as fat, that it is 6.1 metres. Explain how you could use the graph to work out the number of times person X is stationary. So explain is going to be a very crucial word here, and we also need to work out the number of times the person is stationary. So stationary means that they don't move. So when aren't they moving? Well, it's all the flat portions of the graph. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So you're going to say 7 times that they were stationary. And we know this because the flat part of the graph indicates zero speed. State the equation linking average speed, distance moved, and time taken. So out of the way, I'm going to write my formula triangle DST, so therefore average speed equals, cover the S, distance moved over time taken. Part 2, calculate the average speed of person X in the queue, give the unit, don't forget to give the unit. So the distance moved, we know is 6.1 meters. The time is seven minutes. Don't get caught out here. I know the graph looks confusing, but it tells us up here that the person spent seven minutes in the queue. I'm gonna multiply it by 60 because the SI unit for time is seconds. So obviously there are 60 seconds in a minute, hence why I'm timesing it by 60. Pop that into your calculator 
and you'll get a value which rounds to 0 0.015 to three significant figures. And we know that the distance was in meters. I've already told you that I've converted to seconds, which is why the unit here is meters per second. We now need to discuss the difference between weight and mass. So people constantly get this confused. They talk about how much they weigh when actually they're talking about their mass. And I'm going to explain what I mean by that. So weight, first of all, is given by the unit N, which stands for Newtons. Mass is given by the unit kilograms. And so straight away we can see that they have different units. Now it's worth noticing that your mass is unchanged. It doesn't matter where you stand, which planet you're standing on, where you are in space, your mass will remain the same. So if your mass is 50 kilograms on Earth, it will be 50 kilograms on Mars. And that's because it's really a description of what you're made up of. However, with weight, weight has to take into account gravity. And therefore, when gravity changes, your weight will change. If we look at the equation linking the three, you find that weight equals mass times gravitational field strength. So if you have a mass of 50 kilograms, you're standing on the Earth, and which has an approximate gravitational field strength of 10, your weight will therefore be 500 newtons. So this would be the case on Earth. However, on the Moon, if we do the same calculation, we find that although your mass is still 50, your gravitational field strength is hugely reduced on the Moon to, in fact, only 1.6 meaning that your weight on the moon is only 80 newtons. So this is a huge change. Your weight has drastically decreased on the moon, whereas your mass has stayed the same. So although in everyday life we talk about how much we weigh, we say 50 kilograms, remember that's inaccurate and that we're actually discussing our mass. And as long as you can use this equation, weight equals mass times gravitational field strength, you'll have no problems. So we're looking now at the density and pressure topic. So remember density is to do with how close together particles are. Heavy objects have high density and that's because the particles are close together. Lighter objects are less dense and that's due to the further apart spacing of the particles. Now the equation you need to know about is density equals mass over volume. Now I use a formula triangle as usual to remember this and one of my tutees taught me a good way to know this is drunk men vomit. So you want D at the bottom of the triangle, M at the top, V at the bottom. So to work out density, it's mass over volume. Mass is density times volume, and volume is mass divided by density. They're quite interested in you being able to determine the density of various objects. So let's start with symmetrical objects, things that we can easily measure the volume of. So things like cubes, cuboids, brick, for example. Now what you want to do here is obviously looking at the equation density equals mass over volume. You want to measure the object's mass using a top pound balance and get that measurement in kilograms. Then to measure the volume, we simply use a ruler. We measure the length, width and height, multiply those values together to work out the volume, substitute in your mass and volume values into the equation and out pops the density. Now it's going to be far more difficult measuring the density of an asymmetric object, something like an ornament or a vase or a stone. And that's because you can't easily measure the length, width and height of the object, so it's very difficult to determine its volume. This time we're going to use the displacement method. The simplest way to describe this is you fill a measuring cylinder with water, you measure the volume, then you add the object to that measuring cylinder and you measure the new volume. And the difference between those two values will clearly be the volume of the object, so its volume is now sorted. Its mass is easy to determine using the top pan balance method. Substitute the values into the equation, so make sure you state the equation in your answer. That will be worth a mark and out pops density. Let's look at a couple of density example calculations. So question one, 0 0.1 meters cubed of a liquid has a mass of 25 kilograms. What is its density? So we need to use this formula triangle. I use drunk men vomit to help me remember the order. Obviously that's disgusting, but one of my tutees taught it to me and it's pretty helpful. So we can see from it that density is given by mass over volume. The mass has been given as 25. The volume is 0 
So our final answer here is 250. And note the units. The mass was given in kilograms. The volume was given in meters cubed. It's being divided, which is why this is the unit. Example two, a solid has a mass four kilograms and a volume of one meters cubed. What is its density? So same formula, density equals mass over volume. Our mass is four kilograms. Our volume is one meters cubed. Four divided by one is four, and the units are the same as before. We now need to look at the topic of force. So just remember, first of all, the effect that a force has on an object, and that can be that the force changes the object's speed, it can change the object's direction, or it can indeed change the object's shape. You need to be able to list the different types of force. So I've written them out here, and now we just need to have a quick chat about what all of those things mean. So first of all, notice that some of these forces are contact forces, and these are forces which act between two objects that are actually physically touching each other. Non-contact forces is obviously, as the name suggests, when they don't touch. So let's actually have a look at this normal reaction first of all, because that's quite a strange one. This normal reaction force or reaction force or normal contact force, it's all the same thing. That's when an object is on the ground and it experiences a force which is perpendicular to the surface. And what that means, that's where the word normal comes from, because remember in the light topic, a normal line is a line, for example, drawn like this. So here's your glass block, and here are some normal lines because they're 90 degrees to the surface of the glass block. So in a similar way, the reaction force is felt perpendicular to the surface. And I'll show you an example of that later with a car, so don't worry too much now. Friction is a nice straightforward one. That's when two objects slide past each other, they experience a friction force. So for example, a toy car sliding down a slope will experience friction where its wheels touch the slope. Air resistance or drag, that's to do with objects moving through the air. So it could be a car being driven along the road and air particles collide with the car, creating a small force which acts to slow it down. The faster the car is traveling, the more particles that will hit per second hence air resistance increases. And that's why things like cars have to be streamlined to reduce air resistance. Looking at non-contact forces, so let's start with the magnetic force, and that is experienced by any magnetic material inside a magnetic field. Do remember that opposite magnetic poles attract, so north and south poles will attract. Like poles such as two north poles or two south poles repel. And electrostatic force is all to do with static charge, so we're talking about the build-up of charge and it's experienced by any charged particle that's held within an electric field. So a gravitational force, as the name suggests, is to do with gravity and it's experienced by any mass which is found within a gravitational field. And remember these masses may be attracted towards each other due to this gravitational force. The easiest example here is the Sun and the Earth. They're both masses, they're both very large objects and they're held in position due to the gravitational force between them. Weights I've already touched upon. Remember, that is a force acting downwards from any object, and it incorporates both the mass and gravitational field strength. Up thrust, this is when we're talking about water. So for example, a boat sitting on water, although its weight is acting downwards, there's the force of the water pushing back up. So it's the equivalent of the normal reaction force. So we call this up thrust. And if weight and up thrust are equal, then we know the boat will float. The nuclear force is, as the name suggests, to do with the nucleus of atoms or the nuclei of atoms. And it's the strong attractive force between the protons and the neutrons within the nucleus that helps hold the nucleus together. Remember that force is measured in newtons and that you often see a force diagram and that's basically an object which is moving and it will have arrows and the size of the arrow represents how large the force is. So obviously the larger the arrow, the larger the force. Remember in um, your textbook, I'll often talk about balanced forces. That is when two forces acting on an object, they'll be acting in opposite directions to each other. And remember that they have to be the same size for them to be balanced forces. And that basically means that an object which is standing still, i.e. stationary, it won't speed up, it will stay exactly as it is. And it also means that an object which is travelling at a certain speed, when it has balanced forces acting on it, will continue to travel at that speed. It won't speed up, it won't slow down. 
So therefore, if we're talking about unbalanced forces, it makes sense that one of the forces opposing the other force is larger than the other. So if the object is stationary, it will start moving, and if the object is travelling at a certain speed, it will either speed up or slow down. So, what are these forces that we're talking about? I'm going to use the example of a car driving along the street to help illustrate this. So, you have a car, it's sat on the tarmac and it's driving. So the forward force is going to be the driving force from the engine. And that will be causing the car to either accelerate or just carry on travelling at the same speed. Opposing that driving force will be several other forces. First of all, air resistance, otherwise known as drag. Now, what is that? Basically, if you've got a car moving, you've got air whistling past it, and these air particles, they'll collide with the car and they generate a tiny, tiny force which acts in the opposite direction to the direction the car's travelling. And by doing that, they oppose the motion of the car, so they act to slow it down. And we have lots of other forces opposing motion, so there's friction. Remember, friction is the force that occurs between surfaces, so the friction in this example will be between the car wheels and the road. So remember, it's that friction which is useful because it allow, allows the car to grip onto the road and in certain conditions, like icy conditions, wet conditions, or if the tyres have been too worn, you'll decrease the friction between the tyres and the road and that can lead to dangerous occurrences like the car skidding. So a bit of friction is important. You have other forces acting on the car. You have weight. Remember, that's the downward force due to gravity. And don't forget this force. It's called the normal reaction. And that occurs between the tyres and the road surface, and it occurs upwards, so perpendicular to the road. And basically, all the normal reaction is, is it's the force which stops objects kind of being forced into the earth, so it acts against gravity. That's quite a hard one to imagine, but just remember that it occurs at 90 degrees to the surface. Another physics equation you need to be aware of is FAM, so F stands for force, A stands for acceleration, and M stands for mass. So let's work out the various variations. So force equals, we can see that it's acceleration times mass. If we're after acceleration, cover that up, you can see that it is force divided by mass. And lastly, mass equals force divided by acceleration. Touching quickly on the units, mass should always be in kilograms, force is newtons, acceleration is meters per second squared, so make sure you have that sorted and we'll look at a couple of examples now. So in this question we're calculating the resultant force required to accelerate a 30 kilogram object at 1.5 meters per second squared. So yeah, we have mass, we have acceleration, we're looking for force, so force equals acceleration times mass. It's a simple expedient of substituting in those values, so 1.5 times 30, which gives you a value of 45 newtons. Question two, the force on a moving object is 1,000 newtons. Calculate the mass of an object if it is accelerating at 2.5 meters per second squared. So we've been given the force and the acceleration. Mass is given by F over A. Our force is 1,000 newtons divided by the acceleration, which is 2.5, giving us a value which is 400. Don't forget your units, it is in kilograms. So if we had to describe what friction is in further detail, we'd say that it's the force between two surfaces that they exert against each other. And the point is that if one of those surfaces happens to be air, we can't call it friction in this case, we call it something else, which is air resistance, sometimes also known as drag. What effects does friction have? Well, first of all, you've probably felt it if you've rubbed your hands together. That creates a large force of friction and it generates heat. And then the next more obvious effect of friction is that it will impede or restrict movement of the two surfaces past each other. 
So for example, a toy car sliding down something like sandpaper, because there's an awful lot of friction between the sandpaper and the toy car wheels, you'll see lots of friction and it will indeed impede the movement of that toy car. So I want to quickly talk to you about Hooke's Law. Now, Hooke's Law is a pretty boring experiment whereby a guy called Hooke, amazingly, originally hung various weights off a spring and measured the new length of the spring. And then obviously as more weights were added, the spring got longer. And then he plotted a graph which was force, and it's okay to plot force because remember force and weight have the same unit, which is Newton's, against the extension. And you see on the graph that it should be a proportional relationship, which means that as the length, as the weight increases, the length of the spring increases, which makes sense. Then you'll find that the line distorts, and that's because we're no longer increasing proportionally, and that's because the elastic limit of the spring has been reached. It's deformed, it's bent out of shape, and it won't return to its original length. So that's what underpins Hooke's Law. Now we're going to look at a past exam question on it. So a student investigates whether a spring obeys Hooke's law. She uses the apparatus shown in the photograph. Which additional measuring instrument does the student need for the investigation? Well, I've told you it's all about measuring the length of the spring, so we need a ruler. Explain how the student can investigate whether the spring obeys Hooke's law. So we're basically looking for experimental details on what they're going to do. So first of all, you want to measure the original length of the spring using that metre ruler. And then we're going to add a known weight to that hook and measure the new length of the spring. And then we just repeat the process using a range of different weights. So we could go up to 20 newtons, 30 newtons, 40 newtons, or we could repeat at each weight, because remember repeating, calculating an average is really important. And that's worth a mark for just pointing out that particular experimental detail. Time for some moment questions. The diagram shows the apparatus used to investigate moments. The two newton weight is placed 60 centimetres from the pivot. The newton metre is placed 10 centimetres from the pivot. State the equation linking moment force and perpendicular distance from the pivot. Right, moment equals force times perpendicular distance. Remember the units, moments are measured in newton metres. Force is measured in newtons and perpendicular distance is measured in metres. Two, calculate the reading on the newton meter, ignore the weight of the ruler. Okay, don't stress here, we can work this out. Remember the law, which is that clockwise moment equals anti-clockwise moment. So let's look at the clockwise moment. So we've been told that it the weight is 60 centimeters from the pivot. The moment, therefore, clockwise will be 0 0.6 because you need to convert from centimeters into meters times two. And now we need to look at the anti-clockwise moment, I can see that this newton meter is at 10 centimeters. So it's just a matter of substituting them all into the equation and finding the missing value. And I'm going to show you what that looks like. So let's just do clockwise equals anti-clockwise. Please don't run out of space, Hazel. So clockwise was 2 newtons times the distance, which I said was 0 0.6. We've just seen that the newton meter is 10 centimeters away from the stand, so that's 0 0.1, and we're looking for the weight of the ruler, which is the same as the force, so I'm going to write x here, and now we just need to solve 1.2 equals 0.1x, therefore x equals 12 newtons. I'm going to chuck in a few other math things here. So question 6, the person has a suitcase with wheels. The person pulls the suitcase with a horizontal force of 13 newtons for 110 meters, State the equation linking work done, force, and distance moved. Um, I don't know if I've told you this before, but try and remember, especially IGCSE people, remember all your equations as formula triangles because then you won't have to learn as much. And then as soon as you get your paper, write them all down on the back and then you can just re keep referring to them so it won't be so hard to pluck it out of your head. But for the time being, remember work done equals force times distance. So calculate the work done on the suitcase by the person. So let's just write... Be good if I had the pencil. Work done equals force times distance. Force is 13. Distance is 110. And the answer here is 1,430 joules because that is the units. Let's pop it here. 
how much energy is transferred to the suitcase? Okay, this isn't a trick question. Just remember that work done and energy have the same unit, which is joules. So you can literally just copy that number down here. B, the suitcase falls over. Explain why it's gravitational potential energy. Um, it loses gravitational potential energy when it falls. I wondered where the question was there. Remember, you calculate gravitational potential energy by doing mass times gravity times height. Therefore, we know that gravitational potential energy depends on height. So there's your first mark. Um, and therefore, as it falls, H will obviously decrease. And that's all you really need to say. C. The person starts to raise the suitcase again by pulling on the handle with force F. The weight of the suitcase is 150 newtons. State the equation linking moment, force and perpendicular distance. So remember, moment equals force times perpendicular distance. Now we need to calculate the force that the person must apply on the handle to start raising the suitcase. So, remember that the clockwise moment equals the anti-clockwise moment. Our clockwise moment this time is the weight of the suitcase pulling downwards. So we're going to write, um, remember moment is force times distance, so force acting clockwise is 150 times the distance, which is 0 0.32. We're looking for force, so I'm going to write x here, and then remember moment is force times distance. We've been given the distance, which is 0 0.87. And then if I solve for x, I get an answer of, of 55 newtons. This is more maths if you're not happy with how I worked that out. Um, do let me know and I'll add an extra step next time. Now pressure. So pressure is acting all around us. Remember that pressure around atmospheric level is 100,000 pascals or 100 kPa and that pressure increases underwater and if anyone goes scuba diving you'll know this when you have to do your training you need to be aware of the pressure around you and the reason the pressure incre increases is simply because there's more water above you, the atmosphere above that and it's all bearing down on you hence you experience a high pressure. At the top of mountains you'll have less pressure and that's simply because there's less air above you. Now, in terms of when you go up in an aeroplane, just to try and give you some context, has anyone ever noticed that, the, that you get bread rolls in those little plastic packets or a packet of crisps, and it looks like a pillow in an aeroplane? You get super puffy. And that's because when the packet of crisps, for example, was sealed at ground level, then you have the atmospheric pressure around, so that gets sealed into the packet. And so you've got those particles colliding, creating pressure against the walls of those crisp packets. However, when you go into an airplane and you're at altitude, then what you find is the surrounding air, there's less pressure. So you find there's more pressure within the crisp packet, less pressure surrounding it, which is why it puffs out. We know that pressure is given by the equation force divided by area. So clearly, the larger the area, the smaller the pressure and that's because force will be being divided by a larger number. So where is this used in everyday life? Something like a ski or a snow boot. Due to their shape, means that you have a large area. The force, so the weight of the person, is spread over a larger area. And therefore the pressure exerted has decreased and this helps to explain how snow boots work so when you walk in snow boots it stops you sinking into the snow and the same with skis your skis don't sink into the snow they simply slide over let's take an opposing example so a knife for example so your force acts down here so you press down with your hand but the area over which this force is felt, we know, if you look at a knife, is extremely small. A knife's blade is really only about a millimetre in diameter. So that force is spread over a very, very small area, meaning the pressure is huge. And it's that increased pressure which actually creates that sharp cutting surface, which is the reason why knives work so effectively. Looking at an example which combines both, here is a drawing pin used to pin paper to the wall or on a notice board. So here you have a larger area to apply the force over. 
So that larger area means that the pressure will have decreased, which is a good thing because you don't want to stick it into your finger. That would be very painful. However, if we look at the opposite side of a drawing pin, so down here, clearly we have a very small area, which means according to our pressure equals force over area, our pressure will therefore be massive, which explains how it can poke into walls and hold paper to notice boards. Here I'm looking at a question, so which exerts more pressure on the ground, a tank with a weight of 80,000 newtons or a cyclist with a weight of 1,000 newton? The tank trucks have a contact area of 10 metres squared and each of the cyclist tyres have a contact area of 0.06 metres squared. So what you need to do is begin by drawing the triangle to help you sort out your formula. So it looks like this, forces at the top, then it goes area, and then it goes pressure. So I'm going to change to black. So I'm obviously looking at the pressure, so I need the form of the equation which looks like this, force over area. I'm going to start by looking at the tank. So its pressure will be its force, and obviously that will be the 80,000 newtons. Why? Because weight and force have the same units. So that is newtons, and therefore we can use them interchangeably. So that's 80,000 divided by the area, which I've been told is 10. And here's the answer, answer 8,000 newtons per metre squared. Now let's look at the cyclist. Okay, so the pressure will equal the force again, which is this time 1,000 newtons, divided by the area. Now, don't make a mistake here. The area is two lots of 0 0.006. The reason being because, obviously, the cyclist has two tyres. So I'm going to do 0 0.06 times 2, which equals 1,000. Please don't let me run out of space. By 0 0.0. One two, and I'm going to use the calculator here. And the answer here is eight three three newtons meters squared. So, as you can see, it's obvious that the cyclist exerts more pressure because their pressure is eighty three thousand three hundred thirty three. So, make sure you write that the cyclist is the answer. Let's look more closely at the term work done. So what does work done actually mean? Well, it's a measure of a force moving something. And crucially, whenever work done, energy is transferred. An example could be potential energy might do work sliding a brick across the ground. Right, I'm going to go through some miscellaneous calculations to show how you should be approaching questions if you're not quite sure which equation to use. So my first piece of advice is the moment they tell you to start during your exam, turn over to a blank page and start scribbling out all your formula triangles. So you're pretty much making yourself your own personal formula sheet. Even though that will probably take you about a minute, it will be totally worthwhile because it means when you get to a particular calculation, of which there are many in the physics exam, you don't need to be scrambling around in your brain for the correct one. You just refer to your formula sheet and it should literally just be sitting there waiting for you. So let's have a look at what we have here though. So a student pushes a trolley of weight 150 newtons up a slope of length 20 meters. The slope is 1.2 meters high. Calculate the GPE, so that's the gravitational potential energy of the trolley and calculate the work done by the student. So what do we have here? Let's identify. Look at the unit, it's a newton, which means it's both weight and force. We know the slope length is 20 meters and we know that it is 1.2 meters high. So gravitational potential energy is given by mass times gravitational field strength times height. We see an immediate issue, which is that we don't have the mass of the object, we only have its weight. So we need to do a preliminary calculation using this formula triangle, which is weight equals mass times gravity. We're looking for mass, so that's going to be weight divided by gravity. Now the weight we've been told is 150 newtons. Gravity on Earth is approximately 10. You could put 9.8, but I'm going to write 10. And therefore, you're going to write the mass as being 15 kilograms. Now we're ready to use the original equation. So mass is 15. Gravity, I've just said, is 10. 
The height, it says that the slope is 1.2 metres high, hence 1.2 is substituted in here. So once I've substituted that in, I get a value which is 180. It's an energy value, so it needs to be in joules. So I've rubbed the rest out so we've got more space. So in B, we're calculating the work done by the student if she pushed the trolley with a force of 11 newtons. So we have work done, we have force. So the formula triangle rule we need this time is work done equals force times distance. So we're looking for work done. Let's write out the equation equals force times distance. The force we know is 11 newtons. The distance look higher up in the question. She pushed it up a slope of length 20 meters. So that's why we substitute in 20 here. Pop it into the calculator and you know that it is 220. Work done, remember, has the same units as energy, which is why I'm putting 220 joules. So what's the relationship between power and work done? Well, power is simply a measure of how quickly work is done. And notice that they have different units. Work done has the same unit as energy, so joules. Power's unit is watts. A hamster of mass 40 grams runs up a 2 metre curtain in 5 seconds. Calculate its power. So we have mass, which I'm going to immediately convert into kilograms to make sure I don't make any errors. So that becomes 0 0.04 kilograms. We have distance, which is 2 metres. We have time, and we're looking for power. Now, there isn't a direct equation that links these components. Now, this question is actually more complicated than it looks because you need quite a few equations, as there's no equation which directly links mass, distance, time, and power. First equation we need is weight equals mass times gravity. The next one we need is a formula triangle, which is work done equals force times distance. And the last one contains power, which after all is what we're after, which is work done is power times time. What is the common factor linking the two formula triangles? Well, it is work done. So we need to calculate work done first of all, which is force times distance. Unfortunately, we don't have the force. So we're going to have to work that out. And this relies on you remembering that force and weight have the same unit. So if we work out weight, then we can work out the force. So we need this equation first of all, which is weight is mass times gravity. I've already told you that the mass is 0 0.04. Gravity on Earth is approximately 10. So therefore, the weight is 0 0.4 newtons. Now we're going to calculate work done using the equation force times distance. Force and weight have the same unit, which is why I can substitute in 0 0.4 as the force. Distance is 2 as given by the question. So the work done is 0 0.8 joules. And then finally, we can work out power by doing work done over time. How, look how I've laid out my answer with all my equal signs lined up, with all my working out shown. So the work done we know is 0 0.8. I'm only writing it here because I'm running out of space. Divided by time, which is 5. So that becomes 0 0.16. Don't forget your units for power, which is watts. Okay, new for this specification is the types of energy. They've kind of changed the naming system. So some have stayed the same and some are new. So we're going to go through each of them in turn, talking about what they mean and some examples. So starting with chemical energy, this is to do with energy stores and it's associated with chemical bonds. And really your examples here are things like food. Remember food is a storage of energy. The same is true for batteries. Kinetic energy. This is to do with moving an object, so anything that has movement has kinetic energy, so a man running down the road, a bus being driven along the street, they both have kinetic energy. Gravitational energy, as the name suggests, is energy associated with an object gaining height, so anything that has been lifted will gain gravitational energy, for example, a chairlift, a ski resort, an aeroplane, these all have gravitational energy, an apple being picked up, for example. Next up, elastic energy. This is the energy stored when an object is stretched, squashed, or twisted. Um, rubber bands are the obvious place here. Catapults, balloons that have been inflated. Anything that you distort and then pings back to its original shape will contain elastic energy. Nuclear energy will become very important when we look at nuclear fission. 
because this is the energy associated with those reactions. So remember the fuel, uranium-235, which you do need to know that is a huge store of nuclear fuel and therefore nuclear energy. Thermal energy, as the name suggests, is to do with heat. Anything that has gone hotter has gained thermal energy, so a hot cup of tea, for example. Magnetic energy is new for you guys, and this is the energy stored when like poles are pushed closer together or when unlike poles are pulled further apart. So like poles, remember, is two south poles being pushed together. Um, unlike poles would be the north and south pole. So just name any magnets here. So just a simple bar magnet, a fridge magnet that you put on the fridge door. These would all count as magnetic energy stores. And lastly, electrostatic. That's the energy stored when light charges are moved closer together or when unlike charges are pulled further apart. So very similar to the magnetic energy. And your example here is it's hard, but it's things like clouds. Remember when there were lightning storms? There's a huge buildup of static charge. Van de Graaff generators, the same place. Wherever you build up static charge, you will have electrostatic energy. How might an event or process change the energy an object has? Well, first of all, notice that the conservation of energy states that energy cannot be created or destroyed. It's simply transformed or transferred. And let's list a few examples of a process or event that may transform energy. For example, burning fuel. Now we know within fuel we have chemical potential energy and upon burning that will transform itself into heat energy. There are a couple of very specific specification points which we need to go into now. So firstly, give an example of energy transfer by electrical working. And a good example here is a battery, which remember has a store of chemical potential energy. If you take a complete circuit, so one containing a battery, wires, and then a resistor, so don't forget that there is the battery, here is the resistor. Well, when that current flows from the battery to the resistor, remember we get a transfer to heat energy. So this is definitely an example of energy transfer by electrical working. Now we need to look at an example of energy transfer by mechanical working as opposed to electrical working. The easiest thing here is to consider forces. And if you apply a force to a lever, remember levers create moments which are turning effects. And at the other end, that will produce kinetic energy because it will actually cause something to move. So taking an example such as a spanner or a wrench, terribly drawn but you apply a force here using your hand and that creates a moment which causes the wrench to turn which will turn that screw releasing kinetic energy. Next equation I'm interested in is kinetic energy which is half of mass times velocity squared. I prefer not to put this into a triangle I think it's easier if you keep it exactly as it's written and I'll show you how to calculate the different parts so you can actually see that it can be rearranged easily. In this first question, we're being asked to calculate the kinetic energy of a tennis ball traveling at 46 meters per second with a mass of 500 grams. So as always, write out our equation, which is Ke is half mv squared. Be careful with your units because 500 grams isn't in kilograms. So I'm going to put that into kilograms. So remember 500 grams is, is 0 0.5 kilograms. So start substituting in your values. So it's half times 0 0.5 times 46 squared. So start to simplify. So half of 0 0.5 is obviously 0 0.25. 46 times 46 or 46 squared is 2116. Times that by 0 0.25 and that gives us a value which is 529. It's an energy value so it's in joules. Calculate the velocity of a bus travelling through town with a mass of 5,040 kilograms and kinetic energy of, I'm not going to read this number out, of 527,643 joules. So writing out the equation, Ke equals half mv squared. We know the Ke this time, so I'm just going to pop that in here. 
I find it easier to answer these questions if I rearrange later. So half of mass, so that's half times 5040. And we're looking for velocity, so we keep that as v squared. The easiest thing now is to work out half of the mass, which is 2520 times that by v squared. Now we need to get v squared by itself. So the way in which we do that is divide both sides by 2520. So I'm going to do 527,643 divided by 2520, which gives me a value of 209.382 dot 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 equals v squared. And then we just need to square root to make sure we just get a value for v. So v equals 14.46 9. Notice I haven't rounded too early. I'm now going to round to 3 sig fig, so it becomes 14.5, and it's a velocity, which means the unit's metres per second. There's always something about renewable and non-renewable energy. So non-renewable energy is things like fossil fuels, so coal, natural gas oil these are things which are running out they're very good at providing us with energy but if we carry on using them at the rate we're using them now we're going to run out and because they come from fossils they are not going to be replaceable so we're turning to renewable energy things like solar um, wind hydroelectric geothermal all those sorts of things are renewable energy and you need to be able to state the advantages and disadvantages of both they all tend to have the same kind of um, disadvantages, which is that they're unreliable. So for example, if there's no wind, there'll be no wind power, no sun, no solar, um, no waves, no wave power. The only type of reliable energies out there are things like hydroelectric, because that's, remember, when water falls down a dam, that tends to be quite reliable unless there's been no rain. Geothermal tends to be very reliable, but remember there's only very certain places on Earth where you can harness geothermal energy, places like Iceland where there's a gap between the two tectonic plates so places like in England you won't be able to get geothermal energy they could ask you how energy transfers occur for example inside a hydroelectric power station they do like to ask you that because remember water gains gravitational potential energy because it's at the top of the dam as it falls over the dam it will gain kinetic energy transferred into electrical energy to therefore power houses this might seem quite bitty but i'm just literally racking my brain to think of the questions they'll ask you they could ask you how a fossil fuel power station works and actually any power station kind of works in the same way which is that either if they're burning biomass or they're burning fossil fuels what you're doing is you're heating water that water turns into steam the steam turns a turbine a turbine turns a generator and a generator generates the electricity so those are all the steps involved in generating electricity nuclear power is quite an interesting one because it's not technically renewable because you can't make more radioactive material however such tiny amounts are needed it means that it's very unlikely to run out so there is a huge potential for nuclear power however disadvantages include the fact that there's radioactive waste which needs to be stored very carefully because if that escapes into water supplies that could cause cancer there are high decommissioning costs and that means it's just very expensive um, taking the whole power station apart once it's been used for about 20 years or so high startup costs obviously follow so it's going to be expensive to make those factories in the first place The diagram shows some electrical appliances. Which appliance is designed to transfer electrical energy to thermal energy? So we're putting in electricity, we're getting heat out of it. It is clearly the kettle, B. Which appliance is designed to transfer electrical energy to kinetic energy? So again, we're putting in electricity, we're getting movement energy out, which would be the food mixer, A. In all appliances, energy is conserved. What is meant by the phrase energy is conserved? And that is that energy cannot be created or destroyed. It is simply converted from one form into another. The lamp has an efficiency of 20%. Explain what this means. And that means that 20% of the energy input has been transferred usefully. So in the case of a food mixer, 20% of the electrical energy in will have been converted to kinetic energy. Or you could have argued that 80% of the energy input has been wasted. Draw a labelled Sankey diagram for the lamp. Okay, so Sankey diagrams always look like this. Now you do find that a lot of it is wasted, so that's why the wasted energy arrow down here will be much broader than the useful energy. 
And now let's label all of them. So the lamp coming into that will be electrical energy. The useful energy out will obviously be light energy. And then there'll be wasted energy in the form of heat. Because do notice that lamps get pretty hot. Because we haven't been given any numbers, you can't add any numbers, so don't worry about that. We now need to look at efficiency. So using this example, a filament bulb was supplied with 80 joules of energy. 10 joules of energy was output as light, the vest was wasted. Calculate the efficiency of the light bulb. You need this equation. So efficiency equals use for energy out over divided by total energy in and I like to make it a percentage, so times by 100, but that's not altogether necessary. So useful energy out, we know, was the light, so that's 10. Total energy input was 80, times it by 100, so you can pop that into your calculator or just cancel it down like I've just done. So the efficiency is 12.5%. So when we look at solids, liquids and gases, be prepared to draw their particle diagrams. Notice that solids have particles which are in very fixed arrangement, and that's because the particles vibrate around in fixed positions, they have little kinetic energy and there are strong forces between them. Moving to liquids, you see that the particles are slightly more widely spaced apart, they're not touching quite as much, so they have intermediate forces between them and they vibrate more and they don't have fixed positions. Gases now, so you need your particles to be further apart. This is because they have large amounts of kinetic energy. Obviously, they're not held in fixed position, and there are weak forces between the particles. And here's your summary now. Let's start naming the correct conversions between all these various states of matter. So remember, if you're going from a solid to a liquid, that is melting, like a solid ice block turns into water, melting. If you go the other way and the water turns into ice, clearly that will be freezing. If you have a liquid and it turns into a gas, that will be boiling or evaporating. And then when you have a gas and it turns back into a liquid, that is condensation. So that's what happens when you have a shower and you see it getting all misted up on the windows. Condensation is occurring here. Let's now ask ourselves why if a gas is heated in a container, at a fixed volume, why will the pressure increase? And this is all to do with kinetic theory. So we have a gas, it's inside a container of fixed volume, and you heat it. Well, clearly the particles will move faster. They'll collide more often with the container walls. Thus generating a greater force therefore increasing the pressure within the container. I keep mentioning kinetic theory, but what actually is it? First of all, it's a theory used to explain the properties of solids, liquids and gases. Now, crucially, these particles are always moving and they attract each other. And if they're closer together, then you have a stronger attraction. If the particles are further apart, then you have a weaker attraction. There's a couple of scientists you need to know a little bit about. The first one is Robert Brown, and his discovery led to the notion of Brownian motion. Now, all this states is that particles in suspension move randomly. And you can see this in everyday life. So pollen grains on water, smoke particles. And what you can actually observe if you look at pollen grains on water under a microscope is that they move randomly. And that's due to small particles colliding with them, ones which you can't see. They create a small force which actually acts to move those pollen grains. So it's a very basic theory you need to know about. Looking at this in more detail, so we need to first of all look at Newton's first law, which, remember, states that every object will remain at rest or stationary or continue at the same speed 
if it's already moving unless an external force acts upon it. So how does that link to Brownian motion? Well, I've just said that there are small particles which act on the pollen grains, creating small forces which move them. So how does that link to what we've just done? Well, we know the pollen grains appear to be moving, and that must therefore, based on Newton's first law, mean that a small force is acting on them. Where does that force come from? Well, it's the small, fast-moving particles, which we can't see, which bombard the larger particles. So basically what I was just saying about Brownian motion, but just spelt out a bit more in terms of kinetic theory. Touching slightly more on evaporation, so how does the evaporation of a puddle or, or any liquid happen really? So what you find is that the particles have differing kinetic energy. Now those particles with the most amount of energy will evaporate first and they will leave the surface of the liquid. And what will happen is it will mean that the remaining particles have lower average kinetic energy. Do notice that in a closed container, condensation and evaporation will be occurring simultaneously, which means at the same time. So what factors affect how quickly evaporation occurs? Try and use your common sense here. Number one, temperature. Clearly, the higher the temp, the more molecules with higher kinetic energy. Therefore, these molecules can escape, so evaporation occurs more quickly. The second factor affecting evaporation is surface area. As you might expect, the larger the surface area, the greater the area, and a higher proportion of molecules are near the surface of that puddle, for example. Therefore, more evaporation occurs. And then lastly, windiness, or let's call it moving air. This means that molecules which have evaporated are then moved away from the liquid and they can't return. And it's really a diffusion gradient point of view. If there's less water in the air, then more evaporation can occur. So how does evaporation actually lead to cooling? And we know about this from the body, because remember, when sweat evaporates, it cools the body, which is why sweating is an efficient mechanism for helping us cool down in hot weather. So how does it work? Well, we know that kinetic theory states that high temperatures increases the energy of the particles. Those highest energy particles will evaporate first, meaning that the remaining particles have lower average kinetic energy. The remaining particles have lower average kinetic energy and that automatically means if they have less energy then they are at a lower temperature and hence cooling has occurred. And you need to be able to describe what pressure is in terms of particles so taking particles within a crisp packet or within a container or within a squirty cream container, just remember that those air particles collide with the walls of the container. No, what are you doing? Lyra? No, no claws, no claws. No claws. No claws. Should get rid of this. Please be good. Be good. She always meows when I talk to her and she knows she's being naughty. Lyra! So, those particles collide with the walls of the container creating a small force and that force given over a specific area is the pressure and we know this because of the equation pressure equals force over area so you can use the triangle FAP to help you remember that. Do be prepared to provide an answer as to what pressure is or how pressure is produced within a container as that could be worth four marks. And do remember those particles within the container have random movement because they are air particles and they are a gas. 
Why does that pressure increase with increased temperature? Well, clearly increased temperature provides those particles with greater kinetic energy, which means they collide with the walls of the container both more frequently and with greater force, hence you see an increase in the pressure. So if we go the opposite way and we decrease the temperature, clearly decreasing the temperature will decrease the kinetic energy. Eventually the particles will have no kinetic energy whatsoever, and at this point we say that absolute zero has been reached, because the particles have no kinetic energy, there is no pressure. It has a value which is minus 273 degrees Celsius. The diagram shows some gas particles in a container. The piston can be moved in or out to change the volume of the gas. Add arrows to the diagram to show the random motion of the gas particles. Just literally show them just moving around really randomly. Just make sure you add enough arrows. They're just a gas, so it's quite straightforward. Explain how the motion of the gas particles produces the pressure inside the container. This is an answer you can rote learn. So you want to first of all talk about the fact that gas particles have random motion and that they collide with the walls of the container. Then this creates a force, and then lastly state an equation, which is pressure equals force over area. And that is the easiest way in which you'll get three marks. I would really recommend you learn that answer off by heart. Date what would happen to the pressure if you push the piston into the container without changing the temperature. Well, you've got a smaller volume, so therefore the pressure would increase. When the gas in the container is heated, the piston moves outwards. Place ticks against the three correct statements. The gas particles get bigger. No, that's not true. The mass of gas particles stays the same. Yeah, that makes sense. The gas particles move faster. Well, clearly, if you heat them, they're going to gain kinetic energy, so they will move faster. The average distance between the gas particles increases. Again, true, because if they're moving faster, they'll be moving away from each other, therefore increasing the distance. The temperature of the gas decreases. Well, no, the container's been heated, so that's absolute, absolute rubbish. Let's go into greater detail to do with the topic on thermal properties and temperatures. So first of all, why do solids and liquids expand when they're heated? And this isn't a nice obvious answer. That's because at higher temperatures, particles gain kinetic energy, so they vibrate more. And obviously increased vibrations requires expansion in order to accommodate that vibration. And if we take a look at a simple diagram here, when they gain kinetic energy, they vibrate more, they spread out, and by definition, they expand. Now we need to look at everyday examples where expansion affects us. So using a thermometer, remember that's used to measure the temperature. And in a mercury thermometer, the liquid inside expands and contracts dependent on the surrounding temperature. So the hotter it is, the greater expansion you see the higher the reading of the thermometer. When it's cooler, the liquid contracts, so you see a lower reading. When we're looking at building, you often find that concrete is reinforced with steel girders. The point to notice is that luckily they both expand by the same amount, which is essential because otherwise you'd see your building degrade because imagine if the concrete expanded and the steel didn't. Also to do with construction, power cables. You notice these are often left slack, so like this rather than this, and that's to enable them to contract on cold days. And then lastly, bridges, terrible bridge. These have small gaps in them which enable the road to expand on hot days. We need to understand why solids expand less compared with liquids or gases when heated. And the most obvious thing to do here is look at the various particle arrangements. Now here in the solid, you can see that the particles have a tight 
arrangement. They're held in fixed positions with strong forces between those particles. And clearly this will limit expansion and prevent expansion taking place. However, with liquids and gases, there's far more space around the particles, particularly with gases. Look at all this space. Again, with liquid, far more space compared with the solids. Notice that they have weaker forces between the particles, less fixed positions. And then you can see greater expansion can take place. We now need to compare two types of thermometer, liquid and gas thermometers, which are your more traditional type, and thermistor thermometers. Now remember, symbol of a thermistor in an electrical circuit looks like a hockey stick, so it looks like this. So let's compare how they work. So a liquid and gas thermometer, what you find here is that the volume of liquid changes with temperature. As it's easy enough to read the volume, from a scale, you can also record a temperature. With a thermistor thermometer, now remember with a thermistor, when you have increased temperature, you see a decrease in its resistance. And crucially, a thermistor allows a high current to flow with high temperature. And when this current flows at a higher level, it can be detected and displayed on a screen. So that's how you actually read the temperature. Next up, how are thermometer scales calibrated? So that means how are they set? Now, first of all, to create a temperature scale, you need two fixed points. Crucially, these two fixed points need to be exceptionally reliable and that ensures that all thermometers match because you don't want different thermometers having different ideas of temperature. And then lastly, you make a scale by making smaller increments between those two fixed points. So if you have your thermometer and you have your two fixed points, say that that is 20 centimetres, you can then divide it up to show smaller increments. So the scale can be made by dividing the space between the two fixed points. Keywords relating to thermometers now. First of all, sensitivity. So the sensitivity of a thermometer is how small a change in temperature it can detect. The range, as in mass, is the difference between the highest and lowest value. So that would be the difference between the minimum and maximum temperature. And then lastly, and slightly more difficult, is linearity. And this is how constant the changes measured are as the temperature varies. So how will the structure of a liquid and gas thermometer relate to its sensitivity range and linearity? So we've already talked about the sensitivity and that is how small a change in temperature the thermometer can detect. So the width of the thermometer will affect its sensitivity. Narrower tubes will obviously result in larger changes on the scale. So you'll see larger temperature changes. Notice that the type of liquid affects the range. And remember, that's the difference between the highest and lowest temperature the thermometer can detect. And that's because different liquids have different freezing and boiling points. And then lastly, the amount of expansion varies slightly. For differing temperatures 
and this will obviously differ based on the type of liquid and thus affect the linearity. You need to look now at a very specific type of thermometer, which is the thermocouple thermometer. And you need to know a little bit about how it works. So first of all, it contains a probe and a junction. And there's a temperature difference between the two, which creates a small voltage. And as you would imagine, the size of this voltage is proportional to the temperature difference. Linked with voltage is obviously current. And this current can actually be measured. When is a thermocouple thermometer a good thermometer to use? Well, it's good when you have large temperature ranges and high temperatures to measure. It can also create rapid readings and so that's useful when the temperature varies rapidly. So let's make a note of that now. So good for large temperature ranges large temperatures in general and for when the temperature varies quickly as it takes rapid readings. So the meaty topic of conduction convection radiation, this is all to do with thermal energy transfer, so things heating up, things cooling down, starting with conduction. Now I'm sure you're aware that metals are good conductors. The reason being is due to their delocalized electrons, or you can say they're free electrons, but delocalized sounds a bit fancier. Remember the structure of a metal, you'll need to know this for both chemistry and the electricity topic of physics. So to be honest, it's worth learning. So remember that a metal is made up of positive ions surrounded by a sea of delocalized electrons. So what happens in the process of conduction is that when heat is applied, the positive metal ions start vibrating and they gain kinetic energy. What you find then is that the kinetic energy is transferred from the hot parts of the metal to the cooler parts by the presence of these delocalized electrons. So as the electrons move through the metal, they carry the thermal energy with them, vibrating the positive ions more. And before long, you can see how an entire metal object becomes hot. Now, the opposite of a good conductor is an insulator. And these are clearly going to be poor conductors. So to point out things which are poor conductors, first of all, plastic and wood. Why? Because they have no delocalized electrons. And that is the key point here. Air is also a poor conductor. It is a good insulator. And not just because it doesn't have any delocalized electrons, but clearly it's air. So the particles are going to be extremely far apart. So the chance of them vibrating and colliding with other particles to pass on their kinetic energy is going to be very slim, hence why air is a good insulator. So touching on some exam style questions, so polystyrene, why is it a poor conductor? And that's because it contains little air spaces and air is a good insulator because it has no delocalized electrons and the particles are very far apart. So you want to link every single object you're given with whether it's a poor conductor or insulator Next up, for example, a duvet. How does a duvet keep you warm? It's full of feathers or synthetic material that looks a bit like cotton wool. And the point is, again, that it traps air. Air is a good insulator. It's a poor conductor. So less heat transfer will take place, meaning that you stay warmer. So what have we learned? We have learned that metal is a good conductor. Air, wood and plastic are poor conductors. And that Notice that solids will be better conductors than gases. Now we need to look at describing an experiment which allows us to investigate the properties of good thermal conductors. The crucial thing here is they have to be good thermal conductors. So really we're looking at metals. So let's take metal rods. And we need to dip one end in wax. So we could have a copper rod, iron rod, zinc rod. 
and you want to heat up those metal rods. So the way you could do that is by placing them in a hot water bath or using a Bunsen burner. And then obviously as they get hot, that wax will start to melt and the wax will start to drip off the end. And you can collect the wax and measure the amount of it by maybe measuring its mass over a set amount of time, let's say a minute. And clearly the the metal which produces the most wax will be the best thermal conductor. Now we need to describe an experiment to investigate properties of poor thermal conductors. And in this case, we're going to be using water as our poor thermal conductor. And it's a very specific experiment here. So what we're going to do is we're going to get a test tube and we're going to place ice into it. So ice is in the bottom. We're going to use gauze to separate the ice from the water, which is above. Then we're going to apply heat in the form of a Bunsen burner, and that's just to the water at the top. And what you find is that water boils without the ice below melting, thus demonstrating that water is a poor conductor. Now convection is a very different type of heat energy transfer. It only occurs in liquids and gases. You cannot get convection in a solid. It literally makes no sense whatsoever. And the key example we always use is a radiator in a house. Now my wonderful drawing comes out. So here's our rubbish radiator and it's nice and hot because it's got hot water flowing through it and what happens is that heat causes particles of air above the radiator here to gain kinetic energy now because they've gained kinetic energy the air expands which means that, that the particles occupy more space now because they're occupying more space it means that they become less dense so they rise up to here as they rise they become cooler by definition they become denser and therefore they sink and before you know it a convection current has been set up whereby the process keeps repeating and that's how a radiator in the corner of a room can actually heat up the entire room so we've got coffee in here and we don't want it to be getting cold too quickly so what can we do well I've already said you can put it in a polystyrene cup why to prevent conduction losses however because the coffee is hot can you imagine that Bizarrely, it will heat the air above the coffee and it will literally set up a mini convection current above the coffee that keeps repeating itself, speeding up the process of cooling down that coffee. So what you want to do here is add a lid and that's to prevent convection currents being set up. The other great thing about adding the lid is you add a layer of air in here and remember air is a good insulator. So you're preventing heat losses by both convection and conduction by adding a lid. From an experimental view, how can we view convection? Well, you might have done this in school. You get a very specific glass apparatus, which looks something like this. It's a big glass tube. And then you fill it with water and you put some potassium permanganate crystals in one corner. Then you apply heat from a Bunsen burner. And obviously what happens here is the particles vibrate more. They occupy more space and so they become less dense, meaning that they rise. So you'll see a purple vapor or purple color start to form on this side. It has nowhere else to go, so it'll continue along here. As it gets cooler, because there's no heat obviously in this top left corner, it will begin to sink. And then fluid over here replaces the lost fluid on the right hand side. And before long, the whole of the tube will become purple demonstrating that convection has taken place. Last up, radiation, infrared radiation, which we will have met in the electromagnetic spectrum. It is a wave, which means it is not dictated to by the state of matter. What I'm trying to say here is that it can travel in solids, liquids and gases. And that kind of automatically makes it the most difficult to try and prevent heat losses via. However, there are certain things you can do. And that's all to do with the colour of objects. 
So do try to remember that white shiny surfaces reflect infrared radiation, which is why in very hot countries like certain parts of Spain, you might see the houses are white. Same, in, same is true for Greece, and that's because the white colour reflects infrared radiation. Um, anyone with dark hair, black hair, you'll notice that your head gets really hot in the sun. Why? Because black matte objects are very good absorbers of infrared radiation. And notice that the hotter the object, or the greater the difference between the object and the surrounding temperature, the greater the rate at which heat is lost. Putting this more into context, so looking at a thermos flask, am I even going to try and draw this? Oh god. Hmm. Okay, so that's appallingly drawn, but I can still point out a few things. So, first of all, the most obvious thing here to point out is that it has a vacuum. Now, remember that a vacuum is a space with no particles. And we know that both conduction and convection require particles in order to occur. So we say that there is no conduction or convection that can occur within this vacuum. And as always, I'm linking the property with which type of heat transfer it prevents. There are silvered surfaces which line the bottle or line the flask. And the point of that is that it reflects infrared radiation back at the contents of the flask, keeping it hot or keeping it cold. The lid prevents convection currents, which I've already touched upon. And you can say that the whole thing is made out of plastic because plastic is a good insulator. And that's the way you get these answers nice and scientific is by pointing out the various parts of it and what it stops. So looking at heat transfers within a home, how can we stop all our heat escaping? So first of all, in the loft, you can have loft insulation, which contains lots of air spaces. Air is a good insulator, preventing conduction heat losses. You could talk about the cavity walls, so cavity meaning a hole, like a cavity in your teeth. So there's holes within the walls which contain air, again, because air is a good insulator. Do notice though that convection currents can still be set up in air, which is why you often find there's also foam, because that solid foam stops the convection currents being set up. You could talk about the radiators now having a silvered surface, and that's to reflect infrared radiation back at the room. And lastly, double glazing. Remember, that's when you have two window panes which trap air between them, helping to prevent conduction. So the wave topic, let's try and cover as much of this as possible. There are two types of wave you need to know about, transverse and longitudinal waves. Learn the perfect definition for both. Transverse waves, vibrations occur perpendicular to the direction in which the wave is travelling. Key examples here are water waves, light waves and any member of the EM spectrum, infrared radiation, ultraviolet, x-rays, etc. Longitudinal waves, vibrations this time occur parallel to the direction in which the wave is travelling. Your key example here is a sound wave. Be prepared to draw a longitudinal wave and notice that there are periods of refraction and compression, so it's like a slinky, where it comes close together, that's compression, where it moves further apart, that's a refraction. Now the wave equation states that wave speed equals wave frequency times wavelength, wave speed measured in meters per second, frequency measured in hertz, and wavelength measured in meters. What is the frequency of the wave? Well, it's the number of waves per second. If you're labelling a wave, be prepared to draw the amplitude, which is from either the middle line to the top of the wave or to the bottom of the wave. It's not from top to bottom, that's two times the amplitude. The wavelength is the distance between two peaks or two troughs. The time period of a wave is the time taken to produce one wave and it's given by the equation frequency equals one over time period. So let's talk about reflection. That's all to do with waves bouncing. So remember the key thing here is to know the difference between the angle of incidence and the angle of reflection. So the wave coming in and hitting the substance is the incident ray. It bounces off and what you find is the angle at which it bounces off. So the angle of reflection will equal the incident angle. Don't forget to label your normal line, which is a line, it's like an imaginary line drawn at 90 degrees to the boundary surface. 
Refraction is all about a wave changing direction when it enters a new medium and that's due to it either slowing down or speeding up so it's due to a change in wave speed. What you find here is that if you have a light wave entering a glass block it will slow down and it will bend towards the normal. On exiting the block it will speed up again and bend away from the normal so be prepared to draw that and also be aware of what happens when water waves move from a different depth. So when they go from deep water, you find that they're traveling really quickly and that the waves are very far apart from each other. As they enter shallower water, they slow down and the waves become closer together and you'll actually see the wave front getting closer together. If you're struggling to remember that, just remember cars on a the road. They'll be further apart when they're traveling nice and quickly and then when you're stuck in a traffic jam and they're traveling slowly, they're basically on top of each other. Let's take a look at diffraction now. So remember, this is when waves spread out as they pass through a gap and we'll look at some examples. Diffraction can only really occur if the gap size is approximately the same as the wavelength of the wave and you do find that wider gaps cause less diffraction. So let's look at some examples of diffraction. So in example one we've got quite a wide gap You've got the wave front approaching from this direction and you notice here that little diffraction occurs. You'll have something which looks pretty similar to this, so you need to be prepared to draw these shapes. Now in the second example, we've got a much narrower gap. You'll find that far more diffraction occurs and it will look something like this. So you can really see that the waves have spread out. Let's now think about images formed in a plane mirror. So here's our plane mirror, a straight line with the cross hatching behind shows that it's a plane mirror. Remember we have a normal line which is drawn at 90 degrees. So let's pick an object such as a flower and think about the image that will be formed by that mirror. So here is our object, so it's the actual flower that we're looking at. So how does that object actually become an image in our eye? Well, light from an object strikes the plane mirror and is reflected from the mirror surface. And then after that reflection, the light strikes the eye of the observer. But what can we actually say about that image? Well, first of all, the image is obviously the same size as the object, and it's worth making a note of everything I'm writing. And these are quite common sense points, so don't be surprised by them. Secondly, obviously the image will be the same colour as the object. The image will be the same distance behind the mirror as the object is in front. But crucially, the image will be laterally inverted, which means the left will appear on the right and the right will appear on the left. Lastly, this image will be virtual, which means that it can't appear on a screen. Now, one hard question that people do struggle is, is working out how to draw the image when you've been given the object, such as in this case. So here's our plane mirror. Now, the easiest thing to do here is use your ruler to draw a straight line from the object which hits the plane mirror. Then draw a second line just beneath that. And then you want to reflect that back off the mirror. So you could do it really neatly by drawing normal lines here, measuring the angle of incidence. But to be honest, you can probably get away from drawing it by eye, like I'm doing now. And then at the end of these lines, you need to draw the eye, which is actually viewing the object. So something like this is perfectly adequate. And then to finish, I'm just going to change colour. You want to take an approximation, probably use your ruler to measure this distance here so that you can draw the image behind from the same distance to make it make sense. And then just use your ruler to draw a dotted line here. And really, this distance from the object to the mirror should be the same as from the image to the mirror. And if I rub out those kind of explanation lines, Really, this is what your final answer should look like. Now, the equation for the calculation of refractive index is n equals sine i over sine r, which you'll have to learn. 
Now sine i, so remember i is the incident angle, so you just need to pop that into your calculator with the sine in front of it. And sine r, that's the angle of refraction, so again, pop it into your calculator, but first of all, pressing the sine button. Now the critical angle is something they're like asking you about, and it's all to do with the angle of incidence. So every type of medium, every type of substance has its own critical angle. Now, if the angle of incidence is less than the critical angle, you get both refraction and reflection taking place. If the angle of incidence is the same as the critical angle, you get a refraction which occurs along the boundary. If the angle of incidence is greater than the critical angle, you get what's called total internal reflection. So you don't get any refraction, all the light is totally internally reflected. And they make use of this in optical fibres. Five, a student uses a rectangular glass block to determine the refractive index of glass. The diagram shows a ray of red light in the air as it enters the glass block at P. The normal at P is shown as a dotted line, which as we would expect is perpendicular. Complete the diagram by drawing the ray that continues inside the block, labeling the angle of incidence and the angle of refraction and drawing the ray that leaves the block. So use your ruler here and a pencil. So remember, as it enters the block, it enters a more dense medium, so it bends towards the normal which is why I'm doing it here. We need to draw a second normal line down here, try and draw that more straight than I have. And then remember as the ray leaves, it is again parallel to that ray that came in, which is why I'm doing it at this angle. Now we must label the angle of incidence and the angle of refraction. So the angle of incidence is between the normal and the incident ray. The angle of refraction, it's gonna be hard to show that, that's in there. And that's between the normal and the ray that has been refracted. The student measures values for the angle of incidence I and the angle of refraction R. So I is given as 60 degrees, R is given as 34 degrees. So we need to complete the table by inserting values for sine I and sine R. So that's quite straightforward. Just put into your calculator sine 60. And when you've done that, that is 0 0.87 to two decimal places. Put into your calculator sine 34, and that is 0 0.56 to two decimal places. State the equation linking refractive index, angle of incidence, and angle of refraction. So remember, refractive index is given by n. So it's n equals sine i over sine r. So in terms of calculating refractive index, sine i is 0 0.87, sine r is 0 0.56. And when you've put that into your calculator, you get a value which is 1.6 to two significant figures. How should the student continue the investigation to obtain a more accurate value for the refractive index of glass? So that's worth three marks to make three separate points. So the most obvious point to make is to increase the reliability. You want to repeat and calculate an average. You want to vary the angle of incidence more. So you could do 50 degrees, 70 degrees, 80 degrees. And then next, you could draw a graph plotting sine i against sine r. And remember that the gradient will give you the refractive index. Well, a convex lens is otherwise known as a converging lens, and if you know what the word converging means, it is actually just a normal English word. It means coming together. So if you've got a couple of rays and they pass through a convex or converging lens, then they'll be brought together and they'll meet behind the lens. An example of use of this is the magnifying glass. Now, the focal length is the distance between the centre of the lens and its point of focus. The principal focus is the point where the parallel rays meet after they pass through the lens. And then lastly, the difference between a real image and a virtual image is that a real image can be formed on a screen and a virtual image cannot. Now, if I move on and I show you this, hopefully this will make it a bit clearer. So with the convex lens, we can see that when the parallel rays pass through it, they then come together, i.e. they converge. And the point where they converge behind the lens is called the focal point. And that's what's going on here. They're meeting. And we look at someone that's long-sighted. So this is what happens to older people. They start needing glasses to read print, like reading books or whatever. So this time, you've got the parallel rays coming in. They're hitting the lens, but the lens is weakened over time. So rather than meeting on the retina here, they're meeting behind the eyeball, behind the retina. So you're going to get a very blurred image here. So instead, you need a convex or converging lens, which is actually going to cause those rays to come in so that when they're brought onto the human lens, they meet nicely on the back of the eyeball here on the retina. So let's have a go at constructing various ray diagrams. This arrow here is supposed to be the object. 
this is the lens and these are the focal points. So based on my instructions, first of all you want to draw a horizontal line from the top of the object, use a ruler and a pencil for this, and then you want to take it through the focal point like that. Oh gosh, I really struggle on the iPad. Next step, you want to draw a diagonal line which runs from the top of the object arrow through the middle of the lens and we'll see where it crosses. Oh, not very good, not very good. Oh, it's supposed to cross through the middle of the lens. And then where the two lines cross, that is your image. And then you need to compare it to the original object. Now, because it's underneath the line, we know that the image is inverted. If I draw it accurately, the actual height of the arrow, so from here to here, compared with that, believe it or not, would have been shorter, so therefore we know that the image formed is smaller, or we could write diminished, if you're feeling fancy, because that means smaller. And then because it's formed after the lens, then we know our image is real. If they ask you for an example of a lens which works like this, then you can talk about the eye or a camera or something like that. This one's slightly different. We can see that the object arrow is now moved between the focal point and the lens. So we're going to see a slightly different thing happening, but it doesn't matter. You can still use the same process. Horizontal line to the lens. Then we're going to take the line down through that focal point. And then from here on, this is why it's a bit confusing, because if I then draw the diagonal line here, you can see those rays are never ever going to meet on the right hand side ever. They're just going to keep going and going and going. So what you want to do is take a, your ruler and carry on the lines and make them dotted. Make it nice and straight, unlike what I'm doing. Do the same here. And then eventually they'll cross and that's actually where your image will be formed. Up here. So I'm going to draw the arrow. So now let's discuss what we can see. Well because it's the same, not the same height but it's upright, it's the same direction as the object arrow was facing, we know that it's upright. Because the arrow is much larger, we know that it's enlarged. But because it's formed before the lens, we know it must be a virtual image. And an example of this would be the magnifying glass. And your arrows will go this way. The electromagnetic spectrum now, which is a little sub-topic of the waves topic, I do like this topic. Remember that it is a family of waves and they vary just in terms of their frequency and their wavelength. So let's go through those waves first of all. So starting with the longest wavelength wave, so waves which look more like this. So they have long wavelengths because remember the wavelength is the distance between two peaks or two troughs, as opposed to having short wavelengths whereby the wavelength is this big as opposed to this big. So we're starting from the longest wavelength, that is radio waves, then we have microwaves, infrared radiation, visible light, ultraviolet, x-rays and gamma rays. And I'll provide a link below to this video which I love. One of my tutees told me about it a couple of years ago and it's I think it's sung by some South Korean guys. If you start playing it at 30 seconds, listen to the chorus, through three times and you'll have the order nailed in your head. Otherwise, I'm sure there are lots of mnemonics that people can remember and comment below if you know of a good one. In terms of frequency, clearly gamma rays will have the highest frequency because there's more waves per second with gamma rays because they're much closer together. Whereas microwaves and radio waves will have a much lower frequency because their waves are much further apart. The key point to notice with this topic is the various uses of all of these. So we'll start with radio waves. Remember these are used in communication. Microwaves are also used in communication, so satellite communication. They're also obviously used in cooking food. Most of us have microwaves in our kitchen. Then we have infrared radiation, and that is also used in communication. And in this case, we're talking about remote controls. So communicating between the remote control that you're pointing at the TV, for example. So infrared radiation is being given off there. Remember, we met infrared radiation when we were talking about the heat topic. So conduction, convection radiation, because infrared radiation is simply heat being given off from objects. And therefore, infrared radiation is the type of radiation used in ovens because obviously they get hot to cook our food and they are giving off infrared radiation. Visible light, as well as the usual uses, so the fact that we can see stuff with them, it's also used in optical fibers and photography. 
Now we're getting down to the other end of the spectrum, so where the waves start getting much closer together. The next wave we're going to be looking at is ultraviolet, so UV. Remember these are rays that come from the sun. They have various uses such as tanning beds, so sun beds that will have UV rays being emitted. But also you can use it to check whether banknotes have been forged or not. So you hold it up to the UV light and you can tell if they're authentic. Then we're looking at x-rays. Obviously they're used in medicine to create images of the human body. And lastly, gamma rays. Gamma rays are used to sterilise surgical equipment because they're such high energy. They kill things effectively. So that could be killing bacteria on surgical equipment. It could be killing cancer cells. So used appropriately, they're very useful. If they're used inappropriately, they can actually cause cancer. So that's worth noticing. The way they'll ask the questions is it will say stuff like, microwaves are used in communication. Name two other rays also used in communication. You could have said infrared radiation, you could said radio waves, all visible. So be aware here. What dangers associated with infrared radiation? Well, because it's effectively heat, if it gets too hot, it can cause skin burns if you touch it. Dangers associated with ultraviolet, that will be skin cancer, because again, if used inappropriately, that can cause cancer, as well as the rays from the sun. If we're exposed to them for too long, it can cause cancer. How can we reduce danger from exposure to ultraviolet? Well, wearing sun cream, wearing sunglasses to protect our eyes, limiting our exposure time, covering up wearing clothes. To protect ourselves from x-rays, we need to limit our exposure time, hide behind lead screens, wear protective clothing, and the same is true of gamma rays. You really don't want to be exposed to these rays for too long. They could ask you what all these rays have in common, and that is that they are all transverse waves. So in all cases, vibrations occur perpendicular to the direction which the wave is traveling. Remember, that's your perfect definition of a transverse wave. They clearly all transfer energy, they may all be reflected, refracted, and diffracted, so they can all bounce off objects, they can all change directions, they go through a different medium, and lastly, they travel at the same speed, which is 300 million meters per second. What is an echo? Well, it's a reflected sound wave. Remember they use echo sounding for working out to the depth of the ocean, so they'll send down some sound waves. They'll record the time it takes for the sound wave to be transmitted and then be received again by the transmitter. You use the equation speed equals distance over time, so you know the speed of the sound wave. You've recorded the time, just make sure you have the time because obviously if you use the full time, then that's the time it took to, for the wave to hit the bottom and come back up, whereas the distance is only from the transmitter to the bottom, which is why you have to have the time. What is ultrasound? Well, ultrasound is a longitudinal sound wave, which is above the range of human hearing, so it's above 20,000 hertz. Try and be really detailed with your answers there. Infrasound is sound which is too low for the human ear to hear, so it's below 20 hertz. The last thing to do with sound waves is remember that pitch relates to the frequency of the sound wave. So the number of waves per second, the higher that number, the higher the pitch, so the squeaky of the sound, like Whereas amplitude, so that's the height of the wave, is all to do with the loudness of the sound. So the higher the amplitude, the louder the sound. So if we take my rubbish finger here, if I do that, can you see it has a very low amplitude? Because it's very short, so that means it's a quiet sound. But because the frequency is very high, it has a high pitch. So it's a very squeaky sound. Whereas if I were to do this, we've got a much larger amplitude, so a loud sound. But because the waves are so infrequent, it's a very low sound. Two, a microphone is connected to an oscilloscope to display a sound wave. The diagram shows the trace on the oscilloscope screen. The oscilloscope settings are in the y direction one square is one volts and in the x direction one square is 0 0.001 seconds. So let's make a few annotations. So that must mean that up to there is 2 volts and this is 0 0.01 seconds, which means the entire wave cycle is 0 0.002 seconds. So how many periods are shown on the trace? And remember the period is the time for one wave, so that's a complete wave. So there's the first wave and you can see that repeats three times, which is why the answer here is three. And what is the frequency of the sound wave? So frequency is given by 
f, which is 1 over the time period. So we simply do 1 divided by 0 0.002, which gives us a value of 500, and they've already given us the units, which is in hertz. On the grid below, sketch the trace of a sound wave with a smaller amplitude and a higher frequency than the wave shown by the dotted line. So a smaller ampl amplitude means that it will be quieter, so our wave needs to be less high, so it needs to be much lower. High frequency means that the waves need to get closer together, so I'm going to draw it like this. And try and keep it nice and even. So I'm only going up one wave and down one wave, but because they're closer together, I've definitely drawn a higher frequency. The fact that they're lower means that it's a smaller amplitude. So magnetism, well we're going to start by first of all stating which metals are magnetic. That is iron, steel, cobalt and nickel and the two most common examples you'll come across are obviously iron and steel. Do notice that steel is an alloy of iron which means that it contains iron but it also contains the element carbon. A few basics to point out which is if you have a bar magnet or any magnet remember that two north poles will repel so if you try and push them together they'll slide past each other. The same is true with south poles, they'll repel as well, and the opposites attract, so a north pole will attract a south pole. Looking at the difference between a soft magnetic material and a hard magnetic material now, the real difference is that a hard magnetic material maintains its magnetism, so steel, for example, is a hard magnetic material, it does not lose its magnetism easily, whereas iron loses it very easily. And to put this into context, if we use a scrap metal yard as our example here, scrap metal yards are full of big old lumps of iron which need moving around. Now you actually use a magnet to move them around and what you do is you turn on a massive iron electromagnet and it becomes magnetised, it clamps down and picks up that metal that it's trying to move and then when you've moved it across to the new position you can basically cut the power source and it will lose its magnetism. You couldn't use steel in this case because you'd effectively find that all that scrap metal would remain stuck to the magnet and you'd never be able to pull it off. So what are the differences between a magnet and a magnetic material? Because they sound pretty similar. Well, a magnet, as we know, a simple bar magnet will look something like this. It has a magnetic field which runs from north to south. So simply it looks something like this. And if we list these points, you can say it has a magnetic field. As you look at the magnet, you can see that it has two opposite poles. And we know that it will attract magnetic materials, such as an iron nail will be attracted to this bar magnet. In contrast, a magnetic material doesn't have a magnetic field. It can be attracted by a magnet, which is again a common sense point. Although it doesn't have a magnetic field itself, a magnetic field can be induced around the magnetic material. If we compare hard and soft magnetic materials, we know hard ones include steel, because they retain their magnetism. Soft magnetic materials put those in inverted commas, such as iron, lose their magnetism easily. We've already mentioned the term, but let's look at it in further detail. So what really is induced magnetism? And that's when a non-magnetic material develops magnetism. You find that atoms in the magnetic material have a small magnet force and that when these forces are pulled into line, the material becomes a magnet. Looking at how a material can become magnetized, well, it can become weakly magnetized or strongly magnetized, depending on how you magnetize it. And weakly magnetizing occurs when you get the material and you hold it close to the magnet. Whereas if you want to strongly magnetise it, you stroke the material with the pole of a magnet. So we've got our material here, which is what we're trying to magnetise. We've got our bar magnet over here, and we're just going to stroke that north pole up and down the material until it becomes strongly magnetised. 
Remember, by adding a solenoid, so that's a cylindrical coil of wire, you can also increase the level of magnetism. So what is a magnetic field line? Well, it's the space around a magnet whereby magnetism can be detected. So how can an object's magnetism be induced? So how can it become magnetic? Well, first of all, you need to start with a magnetic metal, such as iron and steel, and then you can place it inside the magnetic field of a permanent magnet, and its magnetism will be created or induced. Obviously, the moment you remove that object, the iron object, from that magnetic field, it will lose its magnetism. Steel, I've already pointed out, is a hard magnetic material, so it will tend to retain its magnetism. So remember in terms of electrical charges, you're looking at two types, which is positive and negative. And as always, opposites attract, so these will attract if you have two negative charges, then they will repel. And the same is true for two positive charges. Now, how do things actually become charged? So how does a plastic rod become charged? And that's all to do with the transfer of electrons. So charging occurs due to the transfer of electrons. So remember that electrons are negatively charged. So if an object gains electrons, it will become negatively charged. If it loses electrons, it will, by definition, become positively charged. Just remember, when you're thinking about static electricity, it's all to do with electrons being transferred from one place to another. So, for example, a polythene rod, which is rubbed with a cloth, will become charged. Why? Because electrons will transfer themselves from the polythene cloth to the rod so it will become negatively charged. That therefore means it attracts positively charged, charged items because remember opposites attract. The questions always go the same and they'll talk about why does it become charged and literally the two marks you need to specify are it's the transfer of electrons using friction and if you actually look at past exam questions you'll see what I'm talking about. That is so often the answer I can't even explain. Why does a balloon stick to a wall? Well you've charged it using friction the balloon has become negatively charged due to the transfer of electrons and then it sticks to the wall because it repels those electrons away from the wall, meaning that it can stick to the positive charges. I'm trying to think of other questions, so things like why do your hairs stand on end when you touch a Van de Graaff generator? That's because all your hairs become negatively charged, they therefore repel so they stand up on end. Why can't you become charged on a metal slide when you slide down it? Well, that's because metal is a good conductor. So often they'll ask you about metals, um, things not becoming charged. You just need to say that it's a good conductor so the electrons can freely flow. Looking at objects which may or may not become charged. So a conductor, first of all, is obviously something which allows charge to flow freely around it. And your most common examples here are obviously going to be metals, so let's just list a couple, such as copper and silver. Carbon, in the form of graphite, is a good electrical conductor. From a semiconductor point of view, you're looking at silicon and geranium. And insulators, so substances which do not allow an electric charge to flow. We've already mentioned plastics, so let's name a few such as PVC, polythene. You've got glass, rubber, wood, etc. What is an electric field? Well, it's a region in which electric charge experiences a force. So what is current? After all, we know we measure it using an ammeter. We know that it's measured in amps. Well, it's the rate of flow of charge. And in metals, this means the flow of electrons. 
the equation linking charge, current and time. So if I use my formula triangle over here, Q stands for charge, I stands for current, T stands for time. So charge is current times time. So taking an example, so if a current of 3 amps flows over a period of 5 seconds, what is the charge? It's always good practice to write out the equation you're using, so it's Q equals I times T. Q is charge, which we're after. I is current, which is 3. Time is in seconds, so 3 times 5 is 15. And remember the units of charge are coulombs, and that is your final answer. We will do touch briefly on an ammeter. Do notice how it is attached in a circuit. So if I draw a simple circuit up here, and we want to include something which will determine the current, so we want to include an ammeter, well, we add it in series, so it's part of the main circuit, and I'm going to finish off this circuit by adding a resistor. So an ammeter is always added in series. Notice these can be either analog or digital, and that means whether it reads using an arrow which wobbles from one number to another, or digital means that it's something like 2.75 amps, so it's far more precise. You might have already realised, but voltage and potential difference are pretty much the same thing. And we kind of use these terms interchangeably. But what does it actually mean? Well, it is a force which is measured in volts As such, it is measured by, obviously, a voltmeter. And notice, when you add a voltmeter into a circuit, such as one just containing a bulb like this, it must be added in parallel, which means it comes off as a separate branch. Now, what does potential difference of voltage actually mean? Well, it describes the energy given to electrons pushed out. and defines how much energy is given to each coulomb of charge. Going back to our voltmeter temporarily, I've already said that it gets added in parallel. Now again, like the ammeter, it can either be an analog or digital voltmeter. Now think about what the word resistance means in English. It means if you're a resistant person, it means that you don't like suggestions or you're resistant to change, which means you don't want to do it. So resistance in an electrical circuit is all to do with how easily a current flows in a circuit or in a component or material. The units of resistance is the ohm. And the important equations you need to know about come about from this formula triangle, which states that resistance equals voltage divided by current. Now notice that increased resistance reduces the current. Now, how could we determine the resistance of a component in a circuit? Let's take an example circuit. Here's our battery, We've got a bulb, we have a resistor. Now we see from the resistance formula triangle that it's calculated by doing V divided by I. Well, how do we find out voltage? By adding a voltmeter into the circuit. How do we find out current? By adding an ammeter into the circuit. As I've just taught you, the ammeter needs to go in series, which is why I'm gonna add it as part of the main circuit. And I'm interested in the resistance of the light bulb which is why the voltmeter is being added in parallel over here. So once you get your readings from your ammeter and your voltmeter, then you can substitute them into this equation to work out the resistance, making sure you give your final answer with the unit ohm. So now we need to look at how the resistance of a wire changes dependent on both its diameter. So if we take a cross section of the wire, from this distance to this distance, and also its length. So obviously how long the wire is. Now notice that resistance is directly proportional to the wire's length. So if you double the length, you double the resistance. 
Now, if you look at how the resistance to the wire is affected by the diameter, you see a different relationship, which is that the resistance is inversely proportional to diameter of the wire. And that means if you halve the cross-sectional area, you get a doubling of the resistance. So let's think about it. Ideally, if you want low resistance, you want a nice wide wire and you want it to be short. If you take a very skinny wire and you make it very long, then you're going to have a high resistance. There are a few graphs I want to talk through now. Now do remember Ohm's law and that states that the current through a resistor at constant temperature is directly proportional to the potential difference across the resistor. And various components obey Ohm's law and some do not obey Ohm's law. Now a wire obeys Ohm's law and you'll see that because you can see it's a straight line through the origin. So clearly you can see that as the current increases, the voltage increases and that's at constant temperature. So a wire obeys Ohm's law. You get a very different shape when you show a filament bulb, so a light bulb. This is not a proportional relationship. We've got a sigmoidal shape, an S shape, and the bulb therefore does not obey Ohm's law because there's no direct relationship between the two. So a 4 volt battery can supply current of 5 amps for 20 minutes before it needs recharging. Calculate how much charge the battery can provide before it needs recharging. At this point what I always do is I draw out my formula triangles because why not? It's good to get your head um, nice and into the question and knowing that you actually know stuff that you can use. So the first one is voltage is current times resistance. The next one is charge is current times time. And just remember that the units of charge are coulombs, so at the end of a question write a capital C and they're really fussy about how you write the units to make sure it's a capital C rather than a lowercase c in order to get the mark. And remember I just said that resistance is measured in ohms and the sign for an ohm is like this, which I've drawn really badly. Anyway, let's look at the question then. Calculate how much charge the battery can provide before it needs recharging. So we're looking for a triangle that has Q in it. Um, so there's two of those, and what else have I been told? Well, I've got the current because I've been told 5 amps, and I've been given the time, which is 20 minutes. So what I'm going to use is the QIT triangle, so I'm going to write out, because it's always good practice to do this, Q equals I times T, I is 5. Okay, T is 20 minutes, but remember that's not very um, scientific, so we're going to convert that into seconds by doing 20 times 60. And the answer here is 6,000. And like I just said, the units of charge are coulombs, so I'm going to write a capital C here. Okay, so I've drawn a horrendous um, circuit here, but hopefully it will still manage to help you at least some way. So this is an example of the sort of thing you could get in the exam. Um, we can see that we have a series circuit with a battery made up of three cells, an ammeter with a reading of 0.5 amps and three regular resistance in series. We've been given two of their resistances. We don't know the third one and a voltmeter has been added in parallel around resistance number two. So calculate the total potential difference across the battery. Okay, so all you have to do here, because remember potential difference is the same as voltage, is add up those three readings. So that's two plus two plus two, which is six volts, nice and straightforward. Okay, work out the total resistance. So it'd be tempting here to try and add up all the resistances of the individual resistors. You can't do that because you don't know the resistance of resistor three. So we're gonna have to do this a different way and we're gonna use this equation triangle. So resistance is V divided by I. The V is six, which I just worked out. I is 0.5 given by the ammeter and therefore the answer is 12 and the units are ohms. Okay, finally calculate the resistance of R3. So, if we know that the total resistance is 12 ohms but we've been given R1 and R2, that's 6 ohms, that tells us the difference between those two values will be R3's value. So 12 takes 6 is obviously 6 and that is 6 ohms. Three. The photograph shows an electrical appliance called a toaster. The toaster has a power of 1,800 watts when operating a voltage of 230 volts. 
state the equation linking power, current and voltage. So I'm going to put my formula triangle nice and out of the way over here. It's PIV, so P at the top, current and voltage in the bottom. So what is the equation? It is power equals current times voltage. Part 2, show that the current in the toaster is about 8 amps. So current equals power divided by voltage. I always write out the equation I'm using. We know that power is 1,800, dividing it by 230 to give 7.8 to 3 sig fig, which is approximately 8 amps. Which fuse rating would be suitable for the toaster? Remember the fuse rating needs to be slightly higher than that calculated current. And so oh, it's not ideal because 13 is a lot higher, but you can't say 1, 3 or 7. You can't say 7 because it's lower, which means it would constantly have melted when the toaster was in use, which is why D is the correct answer here. B, the toaster uses main electricity. Mains electricity provides alternating current. Describe the difference between alternating current and direct current. So learn these definitions off by heart. An alternating current is one where the current continuously changes direction, whereas a direct current is one where the current flows in one direction only. The photograph shows an electric heater. The power of the heater is 2000 watts. The heater is connected to a 230 volts main supply. State the equation linking power, current and voltage. And I can remember that is PIV. So therefore power equals current times voltage. Calculate the current in the heater. So rearrange so that current is power divided by voltage. Power is 2000 watts. Divide that by 230 volts. And you get an answer which is 8.7 amps. Which of these fuses should be used with the heater? So you're looking for one which is higher and not too high compared with the current you've calculated. And that will have to therefore be 13 amps D because it's the only current higher than the one we've calculated. The two heating elements can be connected in series or parallel. Describe an advantage of each method. So with parallel, the obvious advantage is that you have independent control. So you can turn on and off the heating elements independent of each other. So you could just have one on or both on at the same time. The series one is a bit more of a state the obvious. Here you can use a single switch only to control both heating elements. Some electrical appliances are fitted with an earth wire. Describe how an earth wire acts as a safety feature and that is worth four marks. So state that first of all, the earth wire is connected to the metal casing and that if the casing becomes live, the earth wire provides a low resistance path to obviously the earth and then you can talk about the use of a fuse which is attached to the earth wire so that increasing current will cause the fuse to melt, breaking the circuit which cuts off the supply. Explain why this heater should be fitted with an earth wire and the obvious thing here is because it has a metal casing and, rem and remember metals are good conductors of electricity. Right, long list of electrical symbols you need to know. So let's start with the easiest, most straightforward ones. We have the cell. If we connect two or more cells together, then we have a battery. Next up, this indicates a power supply. And if you draw the same symbol with a squiggle between the two connections, then you have a AC or an alternating current power supply. This gets more complicated now. This particular symbol is the junction of conductors. A lamp is just a circle with a cross in it. Moving on to the family of resistors, so a simple rectangle is just a regular resistor. One that has an arrow going through it is a variable resistor. I always call the thermistor a hockey stick because of its shape. So you have a regular resistor with what I call the hockey stick going through it. That is a temperature dependent resistor or a thermistor as it is better known. When arrows approach, it means that something is dependent and the arrows represent light. So you have a light dependent resistor here or an LDR.
more basic now is the switch and this one is open remember that if you draw it like this you then have a closed switch a circle with an A we've already looked at is an ammeter which measures current the V with a circle is a voltmeter which measures voltage Something which looks a bit like the play button is a diode, which remember only allows current to flow in one direction only. Arrows coming out of it, then you have a light emitting diode or an LED. And then last but not least, a rectangle with a line going through it is a fuse, which remember is a safety device because it melts when the current is too high, cutting off the circuit. We just need to discuss current and voltage rules for both a series and parallel circuit. So notice that in a series circuit, the current is the same everywhere, whereas the voltage of individual components adds up to the total voltage. And I'm gonna show you what that actually means now. So I'm drawing a battery here which let's say it has eight volts across it. Then we've got a light bulb here, a regular resistor here, and I'm just gonna complete the circuit. So if I tell you that the current here is 12 amps, because I've said that the current is the same everywhere, it doesn't matter if an ammeter got added here, here, or here. All those readings would be 12 amps. However, with the voltage, if you added voltmeters here and here, their readings would not be 8 volts. Let's say that this was 5 volts, the reading. That means that this reading here must be 3 volts, and that's due to that second point, that the voltage of the individual components adds up to the total voltage. The opposite is true in a parallel circuit. Here you find that the voltage is the same e everywhere, whereas the current of the individual components adds up to the total current. That means that each of these light bulbs here will have 12 volts going through them. And that explains why with a parallel circuit, how if you keep adding extra bulbs, the brightness remains the same, and that's because they receive the same voltage. However, it will mean that your battery will run out three times as quickly as if there was only one. In terms of the current, pretend that was a two amp bulb. This was a two amp bulb. Well, we know because it has to add up to the total current, this lamp down here is slightly different in that it has a current of one amp. Looking more closely at light dependent resistors, remember this is the symbol diagram depends on light, which is why the arrows come towards that resistor. So these are otherwise known as LDRs. Now notice that as light intensity increases, resistance decreases. It's often used in circuits as an input transducer. It can be used as part of a light sensitive switch, which would make sense. So that if it is placed in a potential divider to deliver voltage to a lamp, the lamp will come on when it's dark. And that's due to an increase in resistance when it gets dark because of the low light intensity. And finally, thermistors. Remember, these are temperature dependent resistors. Their circuit symbol is similar to a hockey stick. So remember that the resistance of a thermistor decreases as temperature increases. It can obviously be used as an input transducer in circuits needing to be sensitive to temperature. Such as in fire alarms. 
Let's look more closely how the fire alarm might work. So the thermistor is placed in a potential divider to deliver high potential difference in high temperatures. Now just remember that a solenoid is a cylindrical coil of wire. Touching now on the right hand grip rule, so this is just a way of showing the direction of magnetic field lines. So my thumb represents a wire, so in this case it's going from north to south, or from up to down. And you might be asked to draw the magnetic field line directions and just follow the direction which your fingers are pointing. Be aware of a uniform magnetic field, and all you'll see here is that the lines the magnetic field lines are evenly spaced and that they're parallel and those are the two points you need to point out with a uniform magnetic field. So looking now at the differences between a permanent and electromagnet, so starting with the electromagnet let's draw a really simple one here, so we've got an iron rod, it's within a solenoid, so a cylindrical coil of wire and we're connecting it to a circuit, so I'm just going to draw a simple cell here. So that's appallingly drawn but hopefully you can see that we have a simple electromagnet so let's label what we have here. We have a soft iron core. We have a coil of wire. And we know that when it's turned on, so let's insert a switch so we can easily turn the circuit on and off. So when that switch is open, the electromagnet is obviously off. When we close that switch, the electromagnet is switched on. So crucially with electromagnets, they're very easy to turn on and off. And they have lots of uses, including in relay switches, circuit breakers, doorbells. Whereas we, if we look at a permanent magnet, so again, because it's the easiest for me to draw, I'm drawing a bar magnet here. You can see that they are always magnetic. They're made out of a hard magnetic material. And they are used in compasses, speakers, etc. Now we're going to look at electromagnetic induction or basically how voltage or current may be induced. It's a very similar concept, we just need to look at it from a slightly different angle. So I hope you realise that with your force and your magnetic field and your current, it's a bit like a physics formula triangle, which is that if you put in magnetic field and you put in current, then you get force. So it makes sense therefore that if you put in the force, you put in the magnetic field, then you should be able to make current and indeed that's what electromagnetic induction is all about. If a wire is moved into a magnetic field at right angles then you find that a voltage will be induced and if it's connected up to a complete circuit that's where your current comes from. Do notice that you must move the wire or the magnets, it doesn't matter which way around you do it, but you must move them at 90 degrees to each other. If they're parallel then you won't induce your voltage. Now, in terms of working out which direction everything's going to move in, this time you use Fleming's right hand rule. So you find, again, that the thumb shows the direction of the force or the motion. First finger is the magnetic field, second finger is the current, but you have to use your right hand because otherwise it won't line up properly if you use your left hand. And this is really how a simple generator works because if you're creating current, then Clearly, you could make electricity from that, and all a generator is, is a machine which creates electricity. So how could you increase the size of that induced current? Well, clearly, you could use stronger magnets, you could use have a stronger magnetic field, you could move the wire more quickly, and you could wrap the wire into a coil. So linked to this is what dictates the direction of the induced EMF. And the key point to notice here is that it opposes the change causing it. Well, what does that mean? So say you have a bar magnet moving towards that coil which contains the current. 
we know that that coil containing the current will have a temporary magnetic field around it. So it will act as a temporary magnet. And what that will actually do is repel the approaching magnet. And I'll make you some notes, which to be honest, if you're not really understanding what I'm saying, you can literally just learn these. So how is a simple electromagnet constructed? And that's simply by connecting a wire to a circuit and running a current through it. How can we increase the strength of the magnetic field of that wire carrying a current? Well, the most basic thing we can do is obviously increase the current and we can also wrap the wire into a solenoid. So if we coil it up, that will also increase its magnetic field strength. We're now interested in increasing the magnetic field of a solenoid. Because it's already in a coil, what you can do now is add more turns of coil, or you could add an iron ore, which is just like an iron bar, which you thread through the middle of the solenoid. You can also increase the current, as I've already specified. Now we need to describe an experiment to show the force acting on a wire in a magnetic field. So what you want to do here is, firstly, you want to place a wire between the north and south poles of a magnet. Then you want to run a current through that wire. And you will see it move. Notice that reversing the current. reverses the direction of movement of the wire. And the same if you also, so three part B really, if you reverse the magnetic field, you'll also reverse the direction of movement of the wire. And obviously the way in which you actually work out which way the wire is moving is using Fleming's left hand rule. Where don't forget that your thumb, your left thumb shows the direction of the force. Your first finger shows the direction of the magnetic field. And your second finger shows the direction of the current. We're now looking at the motor effect, which is the part of this topic which people really aren't a fan of. But if I talk you through the overview first of all, and then we'll look a bit more closely about how it all works. So let's start by looking at what the motor effect really is. And all the motor effect is, know that a motor is a piece of wire that spins. So that's what's happening in a motor, a wire is spinning. And we're trying to work out how we can create that, and that is via the motor effect. And you might have seen a simple motor being built at school. So what you have here is you have two permanent magnets, you have a wire in between them which is coiled up, and then that is attached to an electrical circuit so it can carry a current. And the point here is that when the wire carrying the current is placed within this magnetic field of the two permanent bar magnets, you find that there's a phenomenon which we call the motor effect. And what will happen is that wire will start spinning and you have a simple motor. But that's only if you've got a coil of wire placed within the magnetic field of two permanent magnets and it needs to carry a current. And you've probably heard of Fleming's left hand rule and that's what I'm gonna talk about now. And that's just a way of working out whether the coil moves up on one side or whether it moves down. Because obviously it has to move up to begin its spin, then it moves down moves up, it moves down. So that's what's happening with our motor. So looking at Fleming's left hand rule, you've got to hold your thumb, forefinger and second finger at right angles to each other. Now the thumb represents the force or the motion and that will show the direction in which one side of that coil will be moving. So taking the left hand side for example, in this instance it would be moving upwards. The first finger, magnetic feet, the first finger shows the direction of the magnetic field. And remember that the magnetic field always runs from north to south. So based on that diagram you get given in the exam or in your textbook, have a look at those two permanent bar magnets. Look at the north pole, look at the south pole and make sure that your first finger matches up with that. Your second finger shows the direction of the current. 
And on your textbook, it should show an arrow showing which way the current's running, if it's running clockwise or anti-clockwise. Just make sure that that finger is lined up there. So once you've lined up your magnetic field, which is your first finger, your current, which is your second finger, you'll find that your thumb either points up or it points down. And so it will ask you which direction will the coil move and you will say upwards or you will say downwards. But just make sure you've got them all in 90 degree planes to each other. My way of remembering what finger stands for what is that the first finger is your magnetic field, first field, second, it contains a C, means that it is showing you the direction of the current. So in terms of answering the five markers, which tends to be something like a wire is placed within the magnetic field and a force is felt, discuss. It's worth five marks. So it doesn't matter how they word up these questions, the answer is always the same. You want to start by saying the wire carrying the current, so your coil, has a temporary magnetic field and what that does is it, in and it interacts with the permanent magnetic field of the bar magnets. This creates a force causing the wire to turn. The photograph shows a small electric motor. Explain why the coil starts to spin when the switch is closed. Remember this is a magnetism question. So this is an answer which you can definitely rote learn. So what you want to say is when the switch is closed that the current flows around the circuit. This creates a temporary magnetic field around the magnet, which you can see is near the coil. It's, it's stuck in the coil, so right here is where the magnet is. So this temporary magnetic field interacts with the permanent magnetic field of the magnet, which creates a force, and that force is what is used to turn the coil. And you can mention Fleming's left hand rule just for an extra mark. Suggest how to make the coil spin in the opposite direction. The obvious thing here is to switch the direction of the current, or you could have swapped the magnets over. Suggest how to make the coil spin more slowly. So how do we weaken that magnetic field? Well, we can reduce the current. You could also reduce the voltage or had a weaker magnetic field, which is harder to quantify. So now, what is the difference between AC and DC? Because we hear these when applied to an electrical circuit. So first of all, remember what they stand for. AC is an alternating current. DC is a direct current. And then it's a simple matter of learning their definitions. So an alternating current continuously changes direction. And your example here is mains electricity, so the stuff that comes into your home. Whereas in direct current, the current flows in one direction only. And you tend to find this inside cells and batteries. Looking at the use of generators in everyday life, you can use the example of a bicycle dynamo. And just to explain what this is, so some bikes, so I don't know if you've ever used the Boris bikes in London or any of those bikes you can rent in other countries. I don't know if you've ever cycled them in the nighttime, but they have lights. And it's not because they have batteries that need replacing. It's because they contain simple dynamos, which uses your motion of pedaling the bike to actually power the lights. So we need to explain from an electromagnet point of view how that works. So as you turn your pedals, clearly the bicycle wheel turns. This turns a magnet, which is located within a coil, and this magnetic field of the magnet cuts the surrounding coil, which induces a current. So within a bicycle dynamo, you find that there is indeed a simple generator. The photographs show how an electric toothbrush fits on its charger. The charger and the toothbrush each have a coil of wire inside them. The diagram shows how the two coils are linked by a U-shaped core. This arrangement of core and coil acts as a transformer that reduces voltage. Name the type of transformer that reduces voltage. Well, that would be a step-down transformer. Explain why the coil is made of a soft magnetic material such as iron. Remember, it's because iron is softly magnetising and therefore it loses its mag 
magnetism easily and also you need to state the fact that the magnetic field in the core can change. State the equation linking the input primary and output secondary voltages and the turns ratio of a transformer. This is something you're just going to have to learn. So write input voltage divided by output voltage equals primary turns divided by secondary turns. Please just learn that off by heart. The transformer has 520 primary turns and 30 secondary turns. The input voltage to the transformer is 44 volts. Calculate the output voltage. So let's just substitute those numbers in. So that calculation will look like this. The input voltage is 44. We're looking at the output, so I'm going to put X here. Primary turns is 520. Secondary is 30. It's up to you what maths you want to use to do this. What I tend to do is flip the whole lot so it becomes X over 44 equals 30 over 520. And then all you need to do is use your calculator to do 30 divided by 520 and then times it by 44 to get X by itself, and X will equal 2.5 volts. The diagram shows parts of a transformer. The input voltage to the transformer is 230 volts, the output is 25, there are 100 turns on the secondary coil. Name the type of transformer shown in the diagram. Well, it's a step down because the output voltage is lower, so write step down there. State the equation linking input primary voltage, output secondary voltage, primary turns, and secondary turns. We really need to learn all these equations. So this is what the equation is. Remember that it's input primary voltage over output, which is secondary voltage, equals number of primary turns divided by secondary turns. So now we're calculating the number of turns on the primary coil. So I'm going to be using that equation. And x is therefore np here. And then let's substitute what we know. We know that there are 100 turns on the secondary coil. Oh my gosh, the gardeners are so noisy. And then on the output of the transformer we've got 25 volts so that's voltage on the secondary and then if you scroll up you'll see that the input voltage in the primary side is 230 and now you need to solve that for x so just do 230 divided by 25 times it by 100 and you'll have 920 turns b explain how transformer works in your answer you should include the reasons for using two coils the iron core and alternating supply don't stress too much if you're like oh, i don't know how to crowbar those things into my answer just write what you would write normally and you'll find that they'll just fit in so first of all say that transformer either steps up or steps down the voltage say that the current in the primary coil produces a magnetic field for the third mark say that this current is changing which causes a changing magnetic field in the core you need to say that the core strengthens the magnetic field. Then state that the field lines interact with the secondary coil and that this induces a voltage in the secondary coil. Um, if you think I said that quite fast, just rewind this video and listen again. But you do need to learn all the steps. It's a nightmare and I hate magnets too. You're not alone. We start by looking back in history and look at the original structure of the atom so we can actually understand all our findings that we know to be true today. So originally there was the Thomson plum pudding model. Now you don't need to know too much about this, but just know that a plum pudding, this was in the 1800s by the way, so you can imagine a Christmas pudding if you don't know what a plum pudding is. I don't know what one is. So a big sphere of sponge embedded with different types of fruit and in the case of the plum pudding, those were plums. And Thompson stated that the sponge was made out of positive charge and that those plums embedded within that sphere of sponge were the electrons. Now we know that this is false because we now know the modern day structure of the atom with its nucleus and its shells with the electrons circling. And we're going to talk about the gold foil experiment to help us understand why this new atom became the accepted model. So Rutherford fired alpha particles, and we'll talk about alpha particles soon, at gold foil. Now he found that most of them passed straight through and this was strange because really if the atom was structured like a plum pudding there's no way these alpha particles should have passed straight through but because they passed straight through it told him that the atom is largely empty space which we know to be true. Some alpha particles were deflected and because an alpha particle is positive it told him that they had hit something also positive and that they had been repelled and that made him understand that the nucleus was positively charged which we know to be true because that's where the protons are found. Lastly, very few of the alpha particles were deflected in this way and this told him that the nucleus was very small. So do link together what he did with what findings he found out and the conclusions he drew from those findings. 
and that will help you score really highly. So we now have our structure of the atom. We know that it has a nucleus containing protons and neutrons. Remember this is also known as the nucleon number and that's just the name given to all the particles found within the nucleus. And surrounding the nucleus are the shells of electrons where the electrons orbit. So just to remind ourselves that the mass of a neutron and a proton is one. A mass of an electron is very small, so 1 divided by 2000 or 1800, depends what your teachers taught you. And that the neutrons, because they're neutral, have no charge. Protons have a positive 1 charge and electrons have a negative 1 charge. Now looking at the periodic table, just remember that the atomic number is the number of protons and the mass number is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. And this will become really important when we now come to look at isotopes. You've probably met isotopes in chemistry, so things like carbon-12, carbon-14. Remember that these are atoms of the same element with the same number of protons but a different number of neutrons. If we look at carbon-12 and carbon-14 in the periodic table, they both have an atomic number of 6, which makes sense because they're the same element, which means that they must have the same atomic number. Their mass numbers are different though. Carbon-14 has two extra neutrons when compared with carbon-12. So when we look at radioactive isotopes, we're just talking about isotopes which are unstable and tend to give off radiation. So ionising radiation may be given off an atom and this is a random process and it may give off alpha, beta or gamma radiation and that's what we need to talk about now. So I'm going to start by chatting with you what, what alpha, beta and gamma radiation is and then I'll show you some decay equations. So alpha radiation first of all. So what happens when alpha radiation happens is that two protons and two neutrons are lost from a particular atom and clearly therefore you will have a new element whose atomic number, remember that's the proton number, is two fewer than it was before. And the mass number, because it's lost two protons and two neutrons, will have gone down by four. With beta radiation, what's happened this time is that a neutron has turned into a proton and stayed within the nucleus of that particular atom. So because a neutron and a proton has the same charge, clearly the mass number will be unchanged but the proton number will have gone up by one, so you will have a new element. Now, gamma radiation is very different because it's an electromagnetic wave, so you see no change in mass or atomic number. Do notice that alpha radiation is the largest, it has the largest mass because it is made up of two protons and two neutrons, and it is the most ionizing, whereas gamma is the least ionizing. And ionising is just the ability to cause something else to become an ion, which is a charged particle. So if we compare the properties of alpha, beta and gamma, notice that alpha, as I've already said, is the most ionising, beta is in the middle, gamma is the least ionising. In terms of their penetrating powers, that's how easily they pass through substances. You notice that alpha is stopped by air, beta is stopped by aluminium foil, and gamma is stopped by several centimetres of lead, or several metres of concrete. In terms of their range in air, alpha has a range of only about 5 to 10 centimetres, beta has a few metres range, whereas gamma has an indefinite, infinite range in air. So gamma rays are very different from alpha and beta, because gamma, remember, is an electromagnetic wave, so it doesn't have any mass at all. So no protons and no neutrons. Now it's emitted after an alpha or beta particle has been emitted. And that's through the use of what's called the Geiger-Muller counter or tube. So what you need is a method for actually stopping other rays obstructing and getting in the way. So you use paper because we know that alpha is not very penetrating. So paper is used to stop alpha particles. Aluminium foil, remember, stops beta particles. And the detection actually occurs within the Geiger-Muller tube because the radiation ionizes gas held within that tube. So the Geiger-Muller tube detects current as the radiation in question ionizes gas held within the tube. We use a slightly different method for detecting alpha particles. 
This time you're going to use a cloud chamber. And remember that contains cold alcohol vapor in air. And what you see is that alpha particles moving through that cloud make visible trails of condensed alcohol. Do notice though that as with the beta and the gamma, you can actually detect them using a Geiger Muller tube also, which is probably an easier experiment to describe. A tiny point now, which is what if they ask you what the nature of radioactive emission is? So how is it characterized? Well, that is that it happens spontaneously, so it could happen at any time and also randomly. You can't predict the decay that will occur or the direction in which it will occur. And lastly, it's unaffected by factors which, ought, which would usually alter the rate of reaction. So it's unaffected by changes in temperature and pressure. The table shows the nature of alpha and beta particles. So alpha we know is a helium nucleus made up of two protons and two neutrons, and beta is a fast-moving electron. Explain why alpha particles and beta particles have different penetrating powers. So basically, let's start by looking at the difference. So state, first of all, that alphas are much larger because they're made up of two protons and two neutrons, so they have a heavier mass. They have a higher charge. This means that they cause more ionization, which means they can't penetrate as far. And that's due to all the energy which has been lost as they've caused lots of ionization. And also point out that the alpha particles are more likely to collide with the atoms because they are bigger. Or you could give the converse argument for beta, so you could say they're smaller, they have less charge, they cause less ionization, they have a lower mass. So in this first alpha decay equation, let's have a look. We need to work out the new mass number and the new atomic number of thorium. So we're starting with uranium-238, that is its mass number. Well, I've just told you that you lose two protons and two neutrons in alpha decay, which means the mass number must have therefore decreased by four, which is why its new mass number is 234. Because you've lost two protons, it means that the atomic number decreases by two to 90. And that is your answer. In the second example, I'm after the new mass number of lead. So we've lost two protons, two neutrons again, which is why the mass number will have decreased by four to become 212. And this time we're looking for the original atomic number or proton number of polonium. So we know that we've lost two protons to get to 82, which means the original atomic number must have been two more than 82. So the answer here is 84. In this beta equation, we're looking at what happens to sodium. So I've already told you that in beta decay, a neutron turns into a proton and stays within the nucleus of an atom. Because of that, the mass number is unchanged. So we're going to stay having a mass number of 22. The neutron turns into a proton and stays within the nucleus. And because of that, we have an increase of one on the atomic number, so that turns into 12. And because we've increased our atomic number, we clearly have a new element. And if you look in the periodic table, you'll see that the element with the atomic number of 12 is neon. So in this question, we're looking for the new mass number and the new proton number again. So we have a neutron turning into a proton, meaning that the mass number is unchanged, which is why I'm going to write a 14 here. Because we've gained an extra proton, it means the atomic number will have gone up by one, forming seven. And because you have a new atomic number, we have a new element. And that element, according to the periodic table, is nitrogen. Now we're going to be moving on to looking at half-life and background radiation. So let's first of all state what is background radiation. And it is radiation which is always present in our surroundings. And so you may need to list several sources. So that could be cosmic rays from space. It could be radioactive rocks like granite found in Cornwall. It could be food and drink and medical sources such as x-rays. Now what is the unit for measuring radiation? It is the Becquerel, capital B, little q. And what instruments do we use to measure the level of radiation, whether that's background or not? We use the Geiger-Muller detector or counter. Do remember, if you're given a radioactive source and you need to determine its radioactivity, you must work out the level of background radiation and then, and then subtract that from the value you get from your Geiger-Muller counter to make sure that you remove it from your calculations. So half-life, now let's define it first of all. Remember, this is the time taken for half the radioactive nuclei to decay 
and you might have used coin tossing at school to help you model this. The reason why that works really well is because radioactive decay is a random process and as is tossing the coin and with tossing coins you've no idea, you can't predict whether it will land on heads or tails and it's the same with radioactive decay, you have no idea which of the radioactive atoms will decay first. In terms of using tossing a coin as a model it does have several limitations and this is really the number of times you can do it. I mean realistically probably at most about a thousand times whereas with radioactive decay you're looking at millions of atoms which need to decay. And now I'm going to show you a question involving half-life and I'll talk you through the half-life calculations because they're probably the most difficult part of this topic. A sample of sodium-24 has an activity of 1400 becquerels. On the axis, sketch a graph to show how the activity of this sample changes over the next 40 hours. The half-life of sodium-24 is 15 hours. So at time equals zero, we're going to have an activity which is 1400. We know that the half-life is 15 hours, so look along 15 hours, half of 1400 is 700, so we need a cross there. When another 15 hours has taken place, so at 30 hours, that 700 will have halved again to 350, so we need a mark here. And now you can attempt to draw a curved line, which I'm appalling at. Oh, it's not too bad. Granite is a rock. It contains a radioactive isotope of uranium that decays very slowly. Explain how scientists can use this radioactivity to find the age of a piece of granite. So first of all, make a note that there is a known proportion of activity when the rocks are formed. This means that you can now measure the proportion of uranium now, and then you compare the activity of the original uranium's value with the activity now, and this can help you determine the number of half-lives which have elapsed. And then you calculate the age from reference to half-life. Suggest why the age of a piece of granite could not be found using uranium isotope with a half-life of 15 hours. And that's obvious because the half-life is too short. 15 hours has meant that the decay has occurred far too quickly. And so the activity now would be far too small to measure. Uranium-25 has a half-life of one minute, what fraction of it remains after three minutes? So what you have to do here is work out how many half-lives have occurred. Um, and because it's three minutes and one goes into three minutes three times, three half-lives have occurred. And then all you have to do, because you're finding out a fraction, is do a half times a half times a half to find that one-eighth remains after three minutes. Question 3. Xenon 133 is a radioactive gas used for diagnosing lung problems. In 15 days, its activity falls to one eighth of its original value. What is its half life? So, we need to work out how many half lives occur to get to one eighth. So, what you need to do is you might have to do trial and error, but you need to just do as many half lives as you need to in order to get to one eighth, and the answer is actually going to be three of them. So, three half lives occurred in 15 days. So how long did it take for one half-life to occur? Well, you just need to do 15 divided by 3, and the answer is 5. So 5 days is its half-life. Question 4. The half-life of the radioactive isotope sodium-24 is 15 hours. A sample has a count rate of 240 counts per minute. Its count rate 60 hours later will be... Okay, so this time, again, we need to find out how many half-lives have occurred. So I'm going to do 60 hours divided by 15 and I see that four half-lives have occurred so therefore after one half-life 120 counts would remain but there were four of them so I'm going to times it by a half four times and that is the same as 240 times answer and that is 15 as my answer. So it's count rate after four half-lives have occurred, so I've divided 240 by two, or times them by half four times, and I have got 15 as my answer. So that's 15 counts per minute. Question five, a radioactive isotope of silver has a half-life of 20 minutes. A sample gives a rate of 6,400 counts per second at nine o'clock. At what time will the count rate be about 200 counts per second? Okay, this sounds hard, but again, just use trial and error to work out how many half-lives have occurred. So I'm just going to do 6,400 times a half, and I've got 3,200, so I'm going to times it by half again. And I'm going to keep going until I get to 200. And actually, what I found here 
is that it has taken five half-lives in order to get to 200 counts. So all I did was times 6,400 by a half five times and I got to 200. So like I said, that means five, five half-lives have occurred. And each half-life took 20 minutes, so therefore five half-lives takes 100 minutes. So all you need to do now is work out what 100 minutes past 9 o'clock is. And remember, there's 60 minutes an hour, so that brings us up to 10.40. That one was quite hard, but you can work it out. Like I said, just use trial and error to work out how many half-lives have occurred. Practice doing as many questions as these as possible in order to get good at answering the different types of question. Remember, when you're reading off graphs to look at... You can read off the half-life by looking at how long it took for the counts to reduce by half, and then you need to read across to see how long that took. Take into account background radiation, because you'll see that the graph line will never actually touch the x-axis, and that's because background radiation exists. And remember, but that comes from things like cosmic rays, x-rays, rocks, um, just general stuff, really. And remember, half-life is actually the amount of time taken for half the radioactive nuclei to decay. So, after 42 days, the activity of a sample of phosphorus-32 has decreased from 400 becquerels to 50 becquerels. What is the half-life of phosphorus-32? So, we've gone from having an activity of 400 becquerels to 50, so we need to work out how many half-lives took place. So, there's the first one, which would have taken us down to 200 becquerels. The second one would have taken us down to 100 becquerels. And then the third one would have taken us to 50 becquerels. So we can see here that three half-lifes have taken place. And what was our time frame? Well, three half-lifes must have occurred in 42 days. So then it's a simple expedient of doing 42 divided by 3 to work out how long each half-life took. And that answer is therefore 14 days. Looking at uses of radiation, alpha radiation is used in smoke alarms. I'm going to chat to you how this works. So you have an alpha source in a smoke alarm, which is giving off alpha particles. And what happens is those alpha particles collide with air particles in the air and they ionize them, creating a small electric current, which is picked up by the detector. Now I've already told you that alpha's range in air is very limited. So the moment there's a fire, there's now smoke particles in the air and they obstruct the alpha and they stop it reaching the detector. So the detector gets zero reading and therefore the alarm goes off. Beta radiation is used in aluminium foil thickness, so kitchen foil that you wrap your sandwiches in. So there are two rollers and there's a detector either side. So you've got a source of beta detector on the other side and there's a certain amount that should be picked up. And if that detector reading is too low, it tells you that the aluminium foil is too thick, so the rollers press together to make the foil thinner, and so the detector can pick up the correct amount. In terms of in use in medicine, do remember that we use radioactive sources in medicine, such as radioactive iodine, and we call this a medical tracer, and that's because it's used to diagnose things like kidney problems. So the patient takes a sample of radioactive iodine, it flows through their body and there's a detector which picks up how much radiation there is and you'll see a characteristic graph reading where the reading stays high and that tells you that there's a blockage within the kidney. So they do make great diagnostic tools. Do notice some crucial properties though and that is that you've got to have a, an isotope which decays into a stable product which makes sense because you don't want it giving off radiation. It has a medium sized half life. You don't want it to have such a short half life that you can't actually pick up how much there is because it's already decayed away but you also don't want it to be so long that you're staying radioactive for many years to come because that is dangerous and this is because of all the dangers relating to radiation so remember ionizing radiation causes mutation within our cells and mutation is the first step leading towards cancer so it's pretty nasty stuff we can reduce our risk and limit our exposure to radiation by wearing protective clothing um, by standing behind lead shields, by using tongs to handle the radioactive material, and for using things like photographic film. You see these in little medical badges that radiographers wear, and that will show up if they've been exposed to too much radiation. Looking at use of radioactive carbon, so carbon-14 in carbon dating, so that's when you determine how old plant material is, for example. So carbon-14 is radioactive, and during a plant's lifetime, remember when it photosynthesizes, it takes in carbon dioxide. 
So a certain proportion of the plant will contain carbon-14. Now once it dies, clearly it won't be photosynthesizing anymore. And over time that radioactivity decreases and by comparing the radioactivity of a sample with the radioactivity of a living version of that particular plant you can work out how old it is so that's a very clever dating technique so we're done well done for staying all this way i'm really impressed if you managed to watch the video all in one don't forget about my revision guides my perfect answer revision guides are available on my website right now at www.sciencewithhazel.co.uk you can click on this card to buy yourself a copy of my revision guide which makes the perfect accompaniment to these videos.